Well, welcome. Um, we're going to start with a roll call. Um, Mimi is actually uh, going to be out for the first hour or so of the meeting. So uh, she will be joining us, but Andrew's going to assist us in the meantime. All right. Uh, Drew Dilworth. Here. Amy Bomsey. Here. Kendra Basner. Here. Stephen Bundy. Here. Suzanne Spencer. Here. Eric Dites. Present. Justin Fields. Here. Matthew Hodell. Here. Joel Osmond. Marlo Richardson. Dina Roche. Here. Teresa Schmid. Here. Ujvala Singh. Here. Richard Solomon. Here. Dr. Stephen Sparta. Here. Marshall Whitney. Here. You have a strong forum. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, is there anyone here from the public that would like to be heard on public comment? Seeing no one, I would move to the next agenda item, which is announcements. Andrew? Okay. Uh, as I'm sure most of you are aware, uh, on May the 10th, uh, the Supreme Court issued an order approving um, the new rules of professional conduct. All the rules except for one, the rule that was not approved was uh, Proposed Rule 1.14, which as you know is client with diminished capacity. Um, the State Bar is working to update and create a new rules uh, page, which should be ready by the end of next week that will have all the new rules the executive summaries and uh, red lines comparing uh, the approved rule to either the California rule where appropriate or uh, the model rule where appropriate. So um, that should hopefully be a helpful resource that will be available um, in the next week or so. Uh, the other caveat with the uh, rule approval is um, prior to um, the court's order approving all the rules they sent uh, to the State Bar, uh, they sent back to the State Bar Proposed Rule 1.2.1, which you are um, aware of and will be discussing today, uh, asking the State Bar to consider revisions to comment six to that rule. Uh, the Rules Revision Commission is scheduled to meet in uh, July to consider the public comments received on the two proposals uh, that the Rules Revision Commission has created in response to the Supreme Court order. Uh, those two proposals consist of um, the Supreme Court's edits to comment six. They are being circulated for public comment as um, drafted by the Supreme Court. And then the Rules Revision Commission um, took, a, took a stab at um, clarifying and sharpening the language of uh, comment six. So um, that version is also circulating for public comment. They are out as alternative one and alternative two. Uh, the Re Rules Revision Commission and the State Bar was careful to say they're not competing alternatives because they arguably say and try to achieve the same thing. It's just do you, when you read both options, uh, prefer one or find one um, you know, clearer than, than the other? or? or what have you. So, so that's what's happening with that rule. And then uh, lastly, as some of you are aware, um, the last meeting we discussed uh, 12.0005 and we made some edits and uh, we voted uh, to publish the opinion subject to review of those changes. Staff uh, consulted with the general counsel's office and uh, we determined it would be you know, prudent to circulate that opinion uh, again um, in light of those changes for an additional public comment. So that opinion is out uh, for a 60 day public comment and the deadline on that opinion is June 18th. And uh, that is all I have. And there haven't been any comments so far. Right? Not that I have, not that I've seen, not that I've received. Is that everything on staff report? That's, That's it. it. Okay. All right. Um, the uh, action summary from the April meeting is in the agenda materials that went out at page uh, one through four. Uh, hopefully you've had a chance to look at it. Um, if you need a moment, do so. And if anyone has a motion to approve uh, the action summary, let us know. I move. Second. 
That was you, Richard? Thank you. Okay. Um, does anyone plan to abstain? Well, I guess some people weren't here, so, so we'll do that. Okay. Because there's a cool trick. You can substitute right. the roll call vote. Um, you really, I want to really impress you guys by implementing that. You can't do it here. Maybe it's a good next try. Time. Okay. Uh, Drew Dillon. Yes. Amy Bomsey. Yes. Kendra Basner. Yes. Stephen Bundy. Uh, yes. Eric Deitz. I'm staying. Justin Fields. Yes. Uh, Matthew Hodell. Yes. Joel Osmond. Marlo Richardson. Dina Roach. Yes. Teresa Schmidt. Yes. Ujvala Singh. Yes. Richard Solomon. Yes. Stephen Sparta. <coughs> yes. Marshall Whitney. That's great. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, before we get to our opinions, there's a couple of issues uh, that we want to address, and it's good timing, I guess, since Mimi isn't here at the moment to work with us on the opinions. But the first issue uh, deals with the new rules uh, that are coming out, or going into effect, I should say, and how those impact our opinions. Uh, and we wanted to just talk uh, a little bit as a committee in terms of what we should do in that regard. Um, I think that there's kind of three buckets of, of opinions, if you will. There's a, a couple of opinions that we actually have out for public comment already. Um, that's the uh, you know, attorney directory and advertising opinion, the settlement before uh, withdrawal opinion, and then the you know, uh, advising the client that you've made a mistake opinion. So we have those three opinions that are already out for public comment. Uh, and those public comment periods will conclude um, prior to the effectiveness of the new rules, assuming that there is a prolonged public comment period. Um, then we have another bucket of opinions, which are opinions we're working on, which realistically are not likely to go out for public comment until after uh, the new rules become effective. And then we have a third bucket, which is sort of the in-between. Some of the opinions that we're working on that realistically could end up going uh, out for, you know, being voted out maybe in the next, you know, uh, one or two uh, meetings, potentially. Um, and so they would go out at least initially for public comment before the new rules go, go into effect. And so we wanted to talk a little bit collectively about you know, how we want to deal with that. I guess taking the, uh, the opinions that are already out for public comment first, which are probably going to conclude their public comment you know, significantly in advance of the new rules going into effect. Um, there's been some discussion amongst leadership about this issue, and, and you know, I think that the, I mean, there's two approaches. You could go back and try to, you know, substantively modify these opinions to the extent you think they're significantly impacted by the new rules. The other is to, you know, stick with the, the opinion essentially as it's been written, but where appropriate, uh, you know, give a heads up or, or uh, you know, maybe in a footnote, but make some kind of indication that, hey, there's a new rule coming out and it may affect this particular issue in a certain way. And I'll give you an example. We're not going to get into the guts of, of the, uh, um, the advertising opinion yet, a little later in the meeting. But um, that, for example, talks about the presumption that in the ab absence of a disclaimer, there's a presumption that you know a testimonial is is uh, is inappropriate or is misleading. Uh, the language is different with respect to that issue in in the new rule 7.1, and so um, that's an example where we're saying something substantively that is going to be different under the new rule. I also think, and we can talk about that in detail when we get to that opinion, but it it is. It is a situation where we could drop a footnote and basically to the effect that the new rule doesn't have this presumption. Instead, uh, you know, it states that a testimonial can't, whatever the language is, can potentially be misleading, you know, and quote the, the language from the new rule. Um, so I, I think but I want to get a sense from people collectively that the general view is on these three opinions that are already out there to the extent they're impacted. And, and I know Suzanne's on, on the settlement with before withdrawal, we're now going to have 
and I, I think she's of the view that as that gets finalized, um, and we'll be talking about that later today as well, more substance, that there should be some mention of 4.1. On the lawyer mistake rule, um, that is an opinion that I think was drafted with an eye towards the fact that you know the new rules were were going to be coming out and, and drafted in a way that if they came out as we anticipated, which is what has happened, um, that, that that will fit without you know being drastically re reworked. So I think that the general sense is as to those three opinions, we can you know put in a footnote where appropriate or some kind of comment, but we're not not inclined to go back and sort of, you know, redraft the substantive text of, of the opinions. But I wanted to get other people's view on that quickly before we, uh, we fish a cut bait on that. But we need to make a decision clearly about these three opinions that are out for public comment. Today. Technical question? Yeah. If we just revise an opinion to reflect a new rule, non-substantively, let's say, that does that have to go out for, I imagine it does not have to go out for a new period of public comment. No, I wouldn't think so. so. I would personally think that's the best way to do it. Just drop a footnote where appropriate and let people know that there's a new rule. Is there anybody who feels strongly that as to those three opinions, there's there's some need to sort of rework the substantive analysis or text of the opinion? Yes, Steve. I, I, I guess the my thought is I don't know. It does seem odd to me, it would seem odd to me to put out an opinion right, that we knew was at odds in some significant way right, or with, uh, with the outcomes that would flow under the new rules. It just seems like a curious thing to do. You're not real, you're clarifying a body of law that no longer controls, right? Or that will cease to control very shortly, and you're not providing any advice with respect to the new body of law. It, it feels strange. Now, I don't know whether any of our, I don't, my own sense is that none of the opinions fall into that kind of category, right? I think that they would all provide very useful guidance, notwithstanding. But that's a conclusion that somebody should draw, right, with respect to each of them. And then if, if, if we do draw that conclusion, I think your solution is right. And, and, and I think your, your point's well taken, and, and that is a key. I mean, obviously, if there was a draft, drastic difference, I mean, for myself, for example, in looking at the, the advertising opinion, I think the thing that substantively has some conflict is that presumption. Beyond that, I don't see a lot of substantive difference. We could rewrite it so that it has the new rule number and things like that, but, um, but I, I totally agree with your point, and, may, and, and I do think just saying informally, some of the people that are the lead drafters of those three respective opinions have sort of looked at that to some extent anyway, and I think they're inclined to have reached the conclusion you're saying, but I think may, maybe what we should do is ask everybody um, to look at those three opinions as well, uh, and if, if someone disagrees with that, if someone thinks there's something substantive in there that's in conflict, let us, let us know. I, I would just make a friendly amendment to that, that maybe we put it specifically on the lead draft, or I mean, obviously everybody else should comment as they, but. Yeah. Well, that's fine. I mean, I, we'll have the lead drafter do it, but I welcome anybody, you know, to, to look at any of those three opinions, and if you do see something that you think is a substantive conflict between the new rules that are applicable to it, and the opinion as it is out for public comment, then let the lead drafter know. But it sounds like absent some determination that there is a substantive conflict, that's the type of approach we'll take with those three outstanding opinions. When you say that, do you mean at least dropping a footnote uh, to you know acknowledge that the new rules exist? I, I feel like is that what you meant? Well, yeah, it may be more specific. I mean, in the example of the advertising, I think there should be a specific footnote in that portion of the opinion that says the new rule doesn't have this as a rebuttable presumption, but it does recognize and just quote the language, which is something like, you know, even a true testimonial can be misleading if 
you know, it suggests X, Y, and Z or something, something to grab that. But for the other ones, it may simply be um, dropping some kind of footnote recognizing that new rules have been propounded and are going into effect on such and such a date. And Mimi isn't here, but we can ask her. She, she, she was telling me that one of the recent, I think, LA opinions that just came out has some kind of footnote or notation. And I don't remember exactly what the language is, but they're doing something to say, hey, this is a new opinion that's getting you know, approved, but we're giving you a heads up that you know, there's a new set of rules coming. So it may be as simple as that if it needs to be a little more substantive, like the advertising example, then yep. it'll be a little more. But, but the point is, we're not going to redraft all of the substance of those just to have new rule number sites and stuff like that. Yes, I so. agree with that. OK, so that's the, that's the first bucket. Um, the third bucket, we'll go to the next easiest one. It's the stuff that we're working on now, obviously, that is not going to go out for public comment until the new rules come out. Everyone just needs to be aware. It's self-obvious, but all the, the drafting teams and the lead drafters, you need to be aware that you need to start modifying or, or working on the, those opinions under the rubric of whatever the new rules are. Even if, they're, even if it's substantively the same, we should be citing the new rules because realistically, when those do get to the point where they're going to be approved and go out for public comment, the new rules will be in effect. So it's kind of a no-brainer. I mean, Eric's opinion is a good example. He already did that. The one he submitted today, he's already started to put in the new rule sites and stuff. We just all need to start doing that on the opinions that are, you know, as a practical matter, not likely to, you know, go out for public comment and be approved, you know, uh, until after November 1st, I guess. The last bucket, which um, is maybe a little more difficult, although I think maybe not, and I'll tell you why in a minute. The last bucket's stuff in between. We have a couple of opinions we're working on, and you know, realistically, maybe they would get voted on to, to go out uh, for public comment uh, sometime before uh, November. And so the question is, what do we do with those? Uh, and the reason I say the answer may be easy is that I was having a discussion with Andrew about this, but if you think about the timing, you know, even if we were to say vote something out next meeting to go out for public comment, realistically, if you think about the timing in terms of sending it out for public comment, the length of period that that would take, getting back the responses, considering the responses, subsequently then, you know, finalizing it and approving it, it would be very close even if something is voted out, you know, at the next meeting, we're getting, we're bumping up pretty close to the new rules becoming effective. Uh, and so, and, and, you know, not that we would want to delay things, but we have control, even after it goes out for public comment, we have control on when the final, you know, after that we say, okay, now we're finally officially publishing this, right? And so one way to approach that would be to say that even as to the opinions that are further along, that are maybe you know conceivably going to be uh, approved before November, we really should tweak those now to address the new rules at the level that we're not talking about for the pre opinions that are already out. In other words, even if it's just citing the new rule number instead, you know, fixing that kind of stuff. But maybe we should do that now as a you know, practical matter because they're, they're not going to become final and effective until really close to the November date. And if we had to, we could even sort of force them not going into effect until after that date. And it seems to make the most sense because those really will be so close to the new rules becoming effective that you know, even, even when it's just stuff like the numbering, what, why, why wouldn't we do that? And so I don't know. What do you guys think about that? I, I, I tend to agree with that, but that, that's certainly one way to approach that sort of uh, middle sec section of the opinion. Does anybody have a contrary view? So the poll, what you're proposing, I mean, for example, I'm working on one now right. that seems to be almost there. Uh, I just assume the way we're going to do this, we're going to draft it. I, we'll have to redraft this to analyze it under both sets of rules. Is that, is that essentially what you're saying about it? 
Well, I wasn't thinking both sides. What I'm thinking is, and I agree, your, your opinion is a good example because I think it is close. Um, but to the, I mean, to, we got to look at two things. Number one, the point that Steve made, which is, there, is there anything under the new rules that are applicable to that opinion that it substantively affects the analysis? Uh, and then, I mean, let's just assume it doesn't, okay? If it doesn't, it's easy. Yeah. Even if it doesn't, then it's, then I'm still talking about we need to change the sites to the rules so it's the right rule number and things like that. What would the main sites be? Well, I think would, would the main sites to, be everything under the new rules? Well, well no. There would be two sites. I think there would just be one site. Right. right. So, in other words, your opinion right now as it stands, get it right in front of me, but I mean, you list the authorities, right? And some of it's statutory. Well, that's not going to change. Right. And yeah. then you have some rules like the, you know, I think you said. Yeah, probably refer to about five rules. Right, right. So, I think that we need to refer to the new version of whatever those rules are. And I, I don't think right. I don't think we do both. Right. I think we refer to the new ones, and 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 that's kind of a mechanical thing that you fix. The substantive issue, which is the second issue, is is there anything about the analysis that's different under the new rules versus the old rules? And if there is, then we just need to change it so that the analysis is reflective of the new rule. Forget about the old rule. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, I, actually, I think in your situation, it's not going to be. That that is my gut reaction to that. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> Famous last words. I get it. Okay. So it sounds like everybody's in agreement. Then that's that's how we'll approach these sort of in 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 between uh, opinions. Okay. So so bucket number two and three are okay. are going to be treated the same. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Take some formal action on that. It's really different. Oh, do we need to? I don't I, I think mean, so. you, you can. I don't think so. I think it's more just an understanding. Um, they should all be uniform. And I think the group, does anyone disagree with the approach articulated by Drew? I think so. I mean, I, th I think it's just procedurally kind of how are we, an issue we got to, how are we going to deal with this? I don't, I don't Is there I certain don't drafting know. teams, uh, working groups, uh, you know, drafting that aren't on other uh, working groups? And so, um, just making sure we're all on the same page in terms of how to approach this transition, I think, was the purpose of the discussion. I just a friendly amendment. I would suggest that following this meeting, there be an email sent for the benefit of those not in attendance to reflect the good decision. Sure. Made. So, sure. And also, we have a cross-reference chart uh, from the current rules to the new rules. We can send that as well, which will hopefully make it easier. For you to check, uh, and Matt, I, I made some notations for you, Matt. You're, 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 you're sitting pretty, buddy. Don't, don't, don't be slow. Don't want it. So someone's consternation. That's <laughs> reason. Drew, I just want to ask you a question. Do we have any routine communication between Coprac and uh, the counterpart? The counterpart said, like the bar associations, that also produce opinions, where we could at least communicate that. This is the way that Coprac is going to be approaching it for their own guidance, because they because they all have similar situation and may choose to choose to you know or maybe think thinking about how we're going to do this and at least have guidance from Coprac so we approach it uniformly. So I don't know if we have any regular communication with them or a network of communication with them. I know we. Are you, are you talking about local county bar associations? Yes, I'm talking, I'm talking about the ones produce opinions usually at LA County, of course, and yeah. uh, uh, BASF and uh, San Diego, particularly routine, routinely. Mm -hmm. uh, just to give them a heads up, is this is how co practice going to uh, So I've never communicated formally uh, with them, not, not for any particular reason. There's, I, I don't know that our worlds, uh, although we do similar things in terms of publishing opinions, um, there is no formal or even informal uh, conversation with those groups. I certainly could. I personally, not because I want to take the burden, but I think it might be more effective for those who have relationships with the committees. I think all the committees are touched upon in this committee. I they are, they could certainly share, and it's not really anecdotally, but just conversationally, what this group has, has determined, because they can de they they're free to decide how to proceed as as they see as appropriate as well. That makes, that makes sense. To me. I think there has been informal. I mean, because there are so many people that are affiliated with other uh, associations that 
have been or are on, on COBRA. I mean, I, there's certainly been times where people have had discussions about you know what another committee is doing or thinking about on, on uh, crossover type issues. So, but it's it, to my knowledge, it's always been kind of informal. We're not aware of any process. Um, okay, so uh, second issue we want to talk about before we get to the opinions uh, again touches on um, the pending uh, new rules, and, and this is the issue really. I just wanted to throw it out for a little bit of comment. Um, this is an opportunity for, or there's an opportunity here for COPRAC to be involved in uh, helping educate lawyers about the new rules. And so I throw that out as a topic of discussion. Are people interested in that? Do you want to do that? And if so, you know, what might we think about doing as a way to uh, get out there and be a part of the educating of, of uh, you know the public and lawyers on the new rules. One possibility that um, has been sort of uh, discussed informally is is doing a program, maybe a program down south uh, here in LA, and also a program up north in the San Francisco area, uh, and having that you know uh, be a panel of. Some people from COPRAC, it doesn't even need to be the same people. We could have one panel down south, one up north, what have you. Um, but that, you know, to, to put on some kind of presentation, obviously it would have a different audience than the symposium. Um, this would be geared towards your you know, regular practitioners who don't necessarily do professional responsibility but need to know about the new rules and, and what's significant and what the changes are. So I wanted to sort of get, uh, you know, people's temperature for whether they, you know, would like to do that and ideas about ways you think we might be able to, uh, you know, to be part of that process. Yeah, Eric. So, apropos of the last comment, uh, in San Diego, the um, Legal Ethics Committee of the County Bar Association has a series of four programs scheduled between now and October that will address this issue. And I assume without any basis for the conclusion other than these county bar associations often follow a similar pattern in practice that BASF and LA County and Orange County may engage in similar programming. So rather than what may amount to a somewhat duplicative approach involving COPRAC, notwithstanding the fact that we, do, we are in different orbits, but there is some crossover in terms of personnel. What I would suggest, or throw out there, is given the wonderful uh, technology that we have and that advantage, there may be some benefit to be gained in terms of reaching a wider audience if COPRAC were to record and then stream or, or provide via the web a primer on the new rules that would be accessible to more remote corners of the state that maybe don't have a local county bar association that members could tap as a resource to educate themselves on the new rules and then we're broadening the scope of who we uh, actually benefit. Well and quite frankly people out of state, I mean there are a lot of lawyers outside of California that are very interested in the changes to California rules because they have offices or lawyers all around the country and California is always the one they don't understand. And so, I mean, I think your point's good, enough, but not even just California right. lawyers. I mean, if you stream this thing and you make it available as a webcast or something like that, you could have people from, from all over. So I have a, a couple of questions about that. One is, do we have anything in the budget that would allow us to do this kind of discretionary education? It's something we haven't done before, but we're in a new world now, right? We're not, we don't have the annual meeting opportunities. So we've talked before about maybe trying to do webinars as part of what this group does because we, we aren't able to reach people through the annual meeting the way we used to be. So I'm curious about the budget. And then just want to point out that Sections has already, you know, we've probably all gotten the advertisement that they're doing a three-part series on the, the new rules. So I, I, I sense that there's, you know, a, a potential for, you know, duplicative programming happening at a lot of levels, but that's what I think is a great suggestion, um, you know, 
know, if, if it's in the budget or if there's a budget for it. Yes. Uh, well, I was just going to say, I mean, and beyond the local bar associations, I mean, there's no fucking, there's going to be a bunch of people out there that are going to be doing presentations on the rules. But from my perspective, part of me says, yeah, there's that's a lot of overlap, but in some ways, it's like almost, how can you have overkill on this issue? I mean, there's so many lawyers out there, and not everybody, I mean, e even if there's 50 of these programs between now and November, I mean, you're still not going to capture all the lawyers. So, so the, the fact that a lot of people are doing it, that doesn't bother me so much, uh, per oh, se, that there's going to be, be yeah. overlap. But I mean, your point about the budget is, is a good one. Uh, but I would think, you know, uh, from the bar's perspective, I mean, of all the things, this is one of the things you would think that they would like to be out in front of and have co involved and, and, you know, fund in a reasonable way to, to make happen. I mean, obviously, I don't have the say in that. I mean, it's, it, and it's years too. It's not just. I mean, in my opinion, it's going to take a while to educate the the bar on on this because it's not just what happens between now and November. It, it's going to be the next couple of years as part of a charter, I think, of this of this group, which is great. It's why it's kind of why we're here. I think, in addition, um, we might also reach out to the smaller counties, which don't, which are not often reached. They can't attend the programs in San Diego and San Francisco and LA and so on and see if they would like to have someone come out and give a presentation. I know sometimes folks reach out uh, to uh, the Office of Competence and, and request a speaker, but maybe we can push this, you know, proactively rather than wait for it to come in. Um, and, you know, we're all over the state, certainly, you know, folks could go I able to go closer to Sacramento and, you know, that area and so on, uh, Central Valley a bit, you know, Marshall certainly in Fresno, um, uh, certain parts of Northern, I mean, whatever, we can work out the details, but, uh, and then I also thought we have a newsletter, don't we? The State Bar doesn't, are the State Bar still doing newsletter under the, oh, the alerts? Don't they do so the alerts? alerts? Can we write like a monthly alert? Two rules per alert, or something like that. You know, just make it a standard monthly feature so people get used to looking there for a quick one pager on a rule or two. Is that something we could do with Rebecca? Um, possibly, yeah. I'd, I'd have to talk to her. I mean, so we're kind of conflating a couple different things. There is a possibility to publish an ethics alert, it's not a regular monthly publication, it does come out when there's a significant issue uh, with respect to professional responsibility. It's managed by the Office of Professional Competence. It's usually posted on the ethics page. And then there's the Cal Bar Journal, which um, doesn't, it seems to be transitioning from going out monthly to going out maybe bi-monthly. Um, but, you know, I have less control over um, how I, I certainly can ask and uh, try to work uh, with the folks at, um, with the Cal Bar Journal, um, but you know there's a lot of writing going on um, in terms of the Daily Journal, um, the Reporter. There's um, a lot of written material, um, and, and we can certainly do that. I'm not trying to trying to discourage, but I think. Um, Going back to Drew's original point, and to respond to Suzanne's question about the budget, um, I raised this uh, issue uh, internally with my office. It was well received. I think uh, we could certainly do this. I think it would be recorded. I think we could put it on um, uh, the State Bar's website so it could be accessed in the future by people all over the state or out of state. Um, whether or not we charge for that would be a question above my pay grade, but it would be captured. Um, and uh, we could host one here in LA at this building that would save on costs for us. Uh, we could host one in San Francisco, similar to how we did the symposium. And I think it would be very uh, well received uh, by many people. And I think it would um, 
look really good for the committee uh, to take on the activity. Just, just to be clear, Andrew, so it would be recorded potentially, um, but if we did a, a program in each <coughs> location, state bar location, and we recorded it, so the idea that people would pay to attend it? Yeah, I mean, those are details we, I don't know the answer we, to that, but yes, those are things. We would publicize it in some fashion. Correct. The bar would in some fashion. Correct. Whether it would be free or 20 bucks, I'm not sure. Um, those are details we, we would need to work out. But those are less concerning to me than the initial commitment by this group to see if we could get three or four people in the Southern California area who would be willing to come here on a Thursday or a Friday um, in September or October, and conversely, three or four people in San Francisco would be willing to do it in the state program. Has the Commission for Rural Revision indicated they want to do anything like this? I, is there any potential conflicting messages that will be coming from agencies of the bar? Not that I know. I think yeah. they're done. Would we they be the natural meeting. one to do this? I, I, I think they have one more meeting and they are officially disbanded. That okay. doesn't mean that people that were on the Commission couldn't you know, get together and, exactly. and do a CLE program for sure. One, but I think that the commission itself is done in another month. Yes. Yeah. I thought one, one thing we might add to that. Um, I think Andrew's, Andrew's point was very good, uh, particularly about the fact that we've got a lot of writing that we're thinking about, and uh, uh, and we will have a lot of we will have a lot of programs which we'll be competing. I'm mindful of when the MCLE first first came out. And all of our associations believe this is the end of the rainbow, and and uh, because people were required to get education, and many bars well, were founded on that, and now their income is dependent on it. My point is, there's there's going to be some financial competition among these programs, and particularly if they go online, I think, I think there's a, a point to have a, a to being a clearinghouse for those uh, programs that are recorded, and we can do that. But one of the things, too, we have an opportunity for is the Young Lawyers Division, which, of course, has moved laterally into the California Lawyers Association, has a series of YouTube things for young, young lawyers. There are four or five-minute spots. And the young lawyers might be engaged to, um, to do a series of spots on the new rules. You can, in a very few minutes, take a single rule and, and focus on the and focus on the impact of that rule and focus on the differences. And it would give somebody and would give all lawyers an opportunity to go to a specific rule, a specific spot, and be educated on the spot, I mean on their phone in front of the bench, uh, about changes in, in rule. And the young lawyers division uh, I don't think currently has a well the the association itself, new association, doesn't have a lot of of projects other than within the sections that are doing So perhaps an outreach to their president um, as an offer of our expertise and our collective expertise and network expertise and see if this is something that they want to do to enrich that, to enrich that series that they already have. Sorry, I was just saying, what's going on over there? I feel like there's a huge party happening. Yeah. Yeah. That was, of course, our Yeah, yeah. Steve, um, you had it. Okay, exactly, just, yeah. just very brief. First of all, it seems to me to be a really good idea. I had the same, my comment is in the same vein as Marshall's, but with a little different emphasis, which is that it seems to me that the, uh, or the we have a comparative advantage here, right? Because we do, we can't, we, while we are not right, officials of the state bar, right, and we're not, we, we in a sense grip can be said, thought to be in some sense, uh, uh, representative of it, an arm of it. And I think that's an important view. And the one thought I had was whether it would be, and I, I'm not sure this is a good idea, but whether it would be a good idea to reach out to former members of the commission, right? And to have, at, you know, judiciously, right? Uh, get the right ones, but uh, having having a former member of the commission on a pan on each of these panels, uh, a thoughtful one, would be I think a great way of kind of emphasizing that that link. 
that's a good idea. It, you know, we could we could get down to brass tacks at some point about how many people, but I mean, and how long the program's going to be and how many people. But I mean, I don't see a reason if you you know, let's say it was not your typical one-hour program, but it was going to be two hours, you know, maybe even a little more. I don't see any reason you couldn't have you know four or five people. One of those people be an RRC person, uh, and others be you know co -practical. I think there would certainly be enough there to warrant you know more panelists than you might typically have. Um, and I like the idea. I mean, I don't know if there's a political dynamic to, or any problem with them coming on. I can't think of one off the top of my head. But I like the idea of the link that you know RRC is works for the bar, has, has performed their tasks for the bar, and COPRAC does what it does on behalf of the bar as well, so I think that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah just briefly, I, I think it's a great idea. I, I support the idea of doing it. I think having those programs in you know, the LA area and then one in the Bay Area with our members on it would be really helpful to the public. I think it's really important for the outreach. I mean, I think it would be an important thing to have it be very cost effective and or possibly free for like the webinar that would be or something posted online because I just think the education about the changes and the rules and what you know significant differences there are and some there aren't going to be and some there are that that's incredibly important to what we do and to the public and the outreach and stuff so I think it's a great idea and if there's other bar associations doing things like someone said then that's great you know then there's more out there for people to choose from but I do think it would be important to have it be cost effective or free and available and accessible to people who are looking to, to get that information just in this particular circumstance, you know. So and certainly you could tie these panels into the web uh, streaming or uh, to capture them and have them available for people to watch later on. Because they could that be, be important. Important. I think that's the idea. We wouldn't do a separate. We would do two presentations, and we would capture each of them in, on video, and then make that available, you know, for not only live streaming at the time of the presentation, but make it available after the fact as something someone could watch. I don't. I don't think we do a separate third thing where we just sit in a room. I, mean, I don't think so. I mean, there, there may be a question of where, if we record one as opposed to both. But uh, largely they're going to be different. So I mean, these are all details that we, you know, staff and others can can work out. I wouldn't really worry about that right now. But yeah, those are those are good ideas. And to answer a specific question, no, I would not anticipate a third program where it's just three people in an empty room talking. Um, it's going to be better to record it in real time. And no, and, and you don't at least immediately see any reason that once RRC concludes, people that were on RRC couldn't be panelists with co -practice. None at all. And uh, let me just uh, be frank. I, I thought about that as well. I'm glad Steve brought it up. And I wasn't going to say I, I, I thought it would be a decision for you all at first, you know, whether you just wanted to make it of, you know, have co be the presenters. But personally, I think it would be great to have a single um, person from the RC on your panel and really enhance it. And, um, I personally would, would encourage that. That's certainly a decision for, for you as a group uh, to make. There's no restriction or prohibition on that. I didn't. I mean, personally, I don't think it detracts from COPRAC, especially if we have, you know, four or five panelists. One of them is an RRC, and four other people are, are COPRAC members. And I would also say, depending on the interests of the, the members, I mean, I'm in favor of having more rather than fewer panelists. I mean, you yeah. know. But if there's a point of dimension, yeah, no, terms, right? well, yeah, I, I, within reason. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's my friend, friend yeah. my friendly copy. Um, within reason, but well, uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. So a, a couple of things, and following along on um, Ushvala and Dino's points on on the cost issue, and I do know there's a lot of writing out there, but Daily Journal is a very costly subscription. Um, and a lot of these other things are. And I was just, while we were talking, oh, I'm just going to the state bar. I say I want to find out what's new. You know, there's a little banner. I can find out more about the nuts and bolts of the new fingerprinting rule than I can about what really has changed. There's a little banner running. You hit it, and then you get a list. Here's our new rules, you know, and what in the world? It would be really helpful, I think, at the state bar level, and that's not, I know we're not a function necessarily, but we certainly support 
um, whatever we could, I think, to get at, at the state bar level, click here to learn more, <laughs> you know, whether it's little YouTube videos or little uh, uh, articles one by one. I really do think that um, it should be accessible, it should be free, and it would be great if it's, it generates from the, from the state bar you know, website where that's where people are going to go for, for the real answer. You know, there's going to be a lot of stuff out there they're not going to know, you know, okay, that's what that guy says, but what's the real answer? So it's, I, not I, easy, it's not easy to find it now. Right, yeah. right. And so, I, I mean, to me, this is like go time for, for COPRAC. You know, this is really a, an important function that, that we're willing to fulfill for the state bar, and the state bar should fully util, utilize the committee. I don't know how that dialogue opens up, but I would even suggest that, because I do think time is of the essence as well. There's a lot of other people out there. I would suggest, you know, appointing somebody on this committee to sort of lead that the outreach on this particular thing, maybe, and work, you know, Andrew, you'll know more about how we open the dialogue with the state bar, like how can we help you get this out there in a really, you know, efficient, easy way, you know, that, because I agree with you, it's, it's hard to find now. Yeah, and, and then you add that a lot of solos don't have subscriptions for the, uh, these expensive journals um, which have all of the date information on them. And I think if the e-journal is going twice uh, every two months, then we can fill the gap by having newsletters through the Office of Com Competence, which has you know quick blurbs about the rules. Do like a, a even we can even do two a month. You know, there's enough of us. Our articles have been pushed back by the waves. And so there's some there's some opening at this point. I think we can start writing those short newsletters, and I'm totally happy to take the lead on that. Um, you know, coordinating it anyway. Um, if other people are interested in helping write them. Yeah, I, I just think that um, newsletters, even um, what people need is at least when when the que they have the question. They need to find the answer. Okay? A newsletter comes to you. You're not going to read it. What you're what you're going to want is six months when you actually need to know what is that. What does 1.7 mean? And you know what does material limitation mean? And so, I mean, the newsletter may be fine as long as it gets archived. Then exactly. Really that it should accessible. be accessible. It's not and just a so one-time send out, but then right. it should be available and easy to find on the website. To me, yeah. I know. it's a matter of almost indifference whether it goes out. Initially, it's the most important thing would be to have it there, and then people want to look for it. Yes, you know, I know this is not what you do, Andrew, but then there's a lot of work to be done on the state of the website to easily find the stuff that we're interested in. I mean, yeah. there are other things that the state bar website it's easy to access, but stuff about ethics and rules is weirdly hard to find. Even just the chart with the rule by rule comparison, yeah. I know that there's a kind of an older one that's impossible to find on the website. Yeah, I've created links to all these things. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. What you find. Yeah. But I know that if people are looking for that, so we need to make it. So just so I'm clear, once you find the chart, you don't find the layout of the chart confusing, but you, you find locating the chart initially locating is difficult. The chart. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's buried. So yeah. it right. Navigating the and even the new rules are kind of buried, too. So Yeah. yeah. So the attorney search function, which is frequently used, is intuitive, easily accessible. A uh, quick Google search will take you directly there. It needs yeah. to be that simple. Yeah. The attorney, um, so when you go to the attorney tab on the state bar, I mean, I, I just want to make sure I'm clear what, what you're comparing, the ethics page to the attorney, the attorney uh, link on the what, state What I would suggest is that through revision to the website, the State Bar's website, and perhaps, um, and this may be difficult to do, but SEO, that if your average practitioner may not necessarily immediately think, I should go to the State Bar's website to answer my question regarding the effect of or the meaning of some particular newly defined term within one of the new rules. Instead, they're just going to type a Google search. And so it seems to me it should take you direct, that should be the 
first uh, link that pops up. Because, I mean, it's authoritative, it's definitive, and then, you know, if it's at least initially just the uh, comparison chart, that is a good start. But make it as accessible and as straightforward, and that's also in keeping with the concern about uh, making it readily searchable, findable, locatable for new lawyers. So, um, so you're saying when you use Google as your search function to work to have the state bar resources be, be if not one of the top three results, that's right. one thing. And the second thing, which I also agree with and had the similar experience, is concerned with when you're trying to find ethics information, you gotta go through like four or five clicks before you can get to the content you're looking for. Am I? Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. Taking the criticism in correctly. Okay, got it. Thank you. Observation. Just, just, Observation. Just, Thank you. Just to clarify what Eric was saying when yeah. he says attorney search, it's if you want to find an attorney, look up their you know bar number and all that. Right. That's as easy as pie. Right. The state bar is really good at sorting that out. Got it. The, they should be equal. There's no reason that it shouldn't be equal. I mean, it it, it sort of indicates that like the rules aren't as important as well, you know and that other function. Just one other additional comment on that. The search function for uh, locating attorneys by uh, name and or bar number and or practice area also has built in an algorithm feature that allows you to locate similar sounding names. And so if you type in a search as to um, rules of professional conduct advertising California, um, it should ideally isolate those related rules in a similar manner, again, to make this as low a barrier to use as we can. Right. So the search algorithms on the website. So those are all helpful comments. I, I want to just real quickly, and then so we can move on a little bit, drawing it back to the, the business of putting on a program per se, just for a second, thinking about that from a timing perspective. Um, you know, it's June, we're having our June meeting right now. The rules become effective October 1. Um, excuse me, November 1. Um, realistically, it'll take some time to put this together, you know, even if we're using the state bar facilities to, to you know, get the space, et cetera, uh, promote this thing, so I agree Time is significant. I like Suzanne's idea of maybe having a subgroup of people that are willing to sort of, um, you know, volunteer and take a role on, on interfacing with the Andrew and helping sort of move this thing along. I mean, I guess ideally, in my mind, I would think if we're going to do these programs, they would definitely be before the rules become effective. So I think realistically, you're probably talking like you know maybe September or something like that. So. Uh, cool. Yeah, Steve. I don't know that it's critical that they happen. I mean, it, it, a little bit depends on what else is going on. Right. But uh, there, are, there are different ways to think about it. One is that the, that the rules become effective. Everyone is going to, you know, be on their radar right. screen. Be on their radar screen yeah. more. Okay. Also, that you get the end of the year and people are trying to figure well, out. Well, that's how to true. Do that's their, a good point. On how they do their MCLE stuff and so forth, and so there may be okay. increased demand later. Right. I don't know. So I'm not. Well, we should be. So I, we, I don't think we have to commit to a time, right. but I think maybe we, we should try to see who's willing to volunteer to be on this. We'll make some progress on this front and, and find out, you know, timing-wise what even is available. And then I guess we can approach the issue once that's a little more tangible of, okay, we could do it in September. Do we really want to do that or do we want to, you know, do it after the rules go in, into effect? I mean, I, I guess another thing you could do is if you did do it before, and it is going to be something that is kept and made available, there could be a secondary kind of push, even though it's not going to be live, to promote it after the rules become effective. You know, the bar could do something, hey, you know, your CLE requirements are coming up, the new rules are out, and, you know, don't forget the state bar has these programs they did, and, you know, they could promote them. They, even if they aren't happening live, although I, I and I'm not expert on it, I just 
I have this idea that people like the live stuff better, but maybe yeah, maybe the numbers come out different. I don't, I don't really know. But a anyway, but so what is there anybody who wants to volunteer to be on sort of a subcommittee to sort of interface with Andrew and help with this form? Okay. I'm trying one second. We got a lot of people. <laughs> All right, I, I think that's enough on that for the moment, but I'm glad we had that discussion. It seems like everybody is, is on the same page and wanting to do something productive in that respect. So the last thing I want to mention really quickly before we get to the first of our opinions is that um, we will be having our election today uh, for the vice chair position. Uh, we have two people that threw their name in the hat this year, uh, Steve and Paula, uh, and because of that, we're required to, to conduct uh, uh, an election, and because of Bagley Keene, uh, that needs to be part of our official meeting. So what we're going to do is we're going to hand out the ballots uh, just shortly before we take our lunch break, and everybody will have a chance to fill out their individual ballot. Those will be provided to Andrew. Uh, and again, because it needs to be on the record, Andrew will go and tabulate those. It won't take very long. They'll give us the results, and then we will break for lunch. Okay. So that's it as far as um, our administrative uh, things to cover. What? What's that? Um, so again, we're we're without Mimi uh, for the moment. So. I think what we'll do, if it's okay with you, Suzanne, we'll talk about uh, 14003, which is the settling before withdrawal. This is an opinion that's out uh, for public comment. Uh, we did receive uh, a fair amount of public comment. And uh, if you didn't get that electronically, hard copies of the material have been printed and is available here in the room. And apologies if that didn't get out sooner. It was just a, a, a glitch, so to speak. Um, but Suzanne's the lead drafter on this opinion, and we realized that if, if a number of you didn't have this already or haven't had a chance to look at all of this um, by this meeting, um, that, that's quite possible. What we thought we would do is we've actually talked as a subcommittee, and the subcommittee is Suzanne, myself, Amy, and Joel, Joel unfortunately wasn't able to be here today, but we had some discussion about the public comment, and um, Suzanne's gonna try and sort of synthesize what seem to be some of the central uh, points or issues that are raised in, in the public comments, so you can get a sense of them even if you haven't had a chance to go uh, through these materials uh, line and verse. And there's a couple things she wants to get sub substantive input on from the committee as a whole, and I think the idea is that the next meeting then uh, we may have a you know slightly revised version of, uh, of uh, 14 to 12 3 which hopefully will be in a position to to vote out as as final at that juncture uh, I think that's that's accurate and um, you'll see and, uh, and unfortunately I'm not sure they were inadvertently omitted from the from the agenda materials for some reason but the comment letters um, there were a lot of them, and I have to say that we got some really, really good comments back. Um, a lot, some substantive, some you know, seemed to reflect a little bit of a misunderstanding of what we were trying to do. But overall, the comment letters were really good, and I'm sure there was a lot to digest there. So I'll do my best to, to distill them into what I would consider groups of of issues that people spotted on this one. Um, so overall, I would say that we got both ends of the spectrum in terms of some people thinking we're being too lenient in allowing an attorney to go ahead and settle a meritless claim, and those saying, 
um, attorneys should always be allowed to settle a claim, and there are never any circumstances under which an attorney can't do that because they're zealous advocates for their clients and they have a fiduciary duty to do so. So that's sort of the, <laughs> the breadth of, of the range. know what's true. Yeah. That was a popular Right. I'm that's that's another, that's another aspect really of, of it. Um, that, that, you know, um, there's always a... Uh, there's always some level that you don't know in the in the context of a case, and, and the fact that you have disputed evidence is not enough to trigger the the duty to withdraw. And so, my overall response to these things are twofold. Number one, to the extent because a lot of people did comment, like, well, how do we know that they're in a mandatory withdrawal situation? And the premise of the opinion is that you are in a mandatory withdrawal situation. So the, the, the opinion is not really supposed to be focused on what are the circumstances in which you'll be in that position. We're trying to assume that you're there because the, the rules clearly um, anticipate that there are times that you will be there, that you will have a case that is so meritless that you, you have to withdraw. And so we're trying to assume that, and I think the fix is to make that more clear, because people think that there's this debate about, well, how do we know that it, you know, doesn't that it doesn't support the claim? What if it's contrary? You know, so so I think we could clean up the language there a little bit to make it really clear that what we're talking about is evidence that contra controverts or refutes our story, and so we're clearly there, and it's not a. a determination as to discussion about that. So what we really want to talk about is what do you do once you're there? And San Diego's comments were that, for the most part, you, you have two choices. You can withdraw or you can dismiss the case. Um, settling is not really an option. And they based that on the Zamos decision, which was that malicious prosecution case. And while I think San Diego went a little bit too far with the interpretation of that case, it's, it's a decent point. The Zamos case was a malicious prosecution case, and the whole um, thing being decided was whether or not an attorney could be liable for malicious prosecution in prosecuting a meritless claim. And the holding is that yes, they can be, but the claim has to be so meritless that no reasonable attorney could think that, you know, there's some phrase that they use that no reasonable attorney could ever think that this case has Any merit. Possible merit. Any possible merit. Um, and if you're in that situation, um, you, you dismiss or withdraw. But it doesn't say that's all you can do. It just says you have a duty to move forward with dismissing or um, withdrawing from the, the representation. And what I thought was interesting about the holding of that case, it's really limited to whether you can be civilly viable, and it's not an, an ethics question. Um, but San Diego is interpreting that as meaning you have only two choices. I'm not so sure. I think maybe you have only two choices for civil liability purposes. But it does concern me a little bit that there may be this ethical um, rule, what's that? Like, like an, an ethical opinion that, that maybe you can settle when you have the, but you can settle but you still might be liable for malicious prosecution. Like, I don't know if we really want to be in that space. So I do think we have to do a little more work with the Zamos decision. Marshall. I just skipped through it, but Mr. Wilmoffer's comments make a lot of sense to me, just based on my knowledge of Zamos and the great marriage. Also, I don't feel I could ever endorse the notion that a lawyer without the client's consent can resolve the case. Oh, yeah, just, that, I, yeah. I really don't think you, we should ever say anything that suggests you could dismiss it, which is what, what, is you're, that what you're saying San Diego's suggesting. That's what San Diego's suggesting, but they're saying they got that from Zamos. I don't think it's a close call. Um, it was a controversial call. Me? Yeah, it was a controversial point. Right, it was the majority. I, I noticed that. My it's side of the equation says, is the majority the of the committee says this, but the minority thinks maybe you could just strengthen the, the analysis a little. So I did get the sense that it was heavily debated, but a majority thought that, that it could. That's a good point. That is a good point, though, because 
what I think the language that they're seizing upon, I'm just looking at Zamos now, that there's something in Zamos that says um, holding attorneys liable for damages a, a party incurs as a result of the attorneys prosecuting civil claims after they learn the claims have no merit also will encourage voluntary dismissals of meritless claims at the earliest stage possible. Right. Um, be, and this is the, because an attorney will be liable only for the damages incurred from the time the attorney reasonably should have caused, reasonably should have caused the dismissal of the lawsuit after learning it has no merit. An attorney can avoid liability by promptly causing the dismissal of or withdrawing as an attorney in the lawsuit. And query, how do you promptly cause the dismissal of <laughs> <Your client's consent. laughs> Without your client's right. consent. Oh, right, and the fact you that you your package consent, with, that's the quality. Well, and, and why, or withdraw, because you're not going to have the consent of the client and you have to get out. I mean, the fact that package those two concepts together suggests to me that they're not just yeah. saying you, you can. You can reconcile and those and in Ray Marriage and also because you either get their consent to dismiss, so you can cause the dismissal. Or you don't. If you don't get the consent, you withdraw. Those are those are two discrete different options. I can't think that there's others, but I don't know. Dismissing um, without consent will get you sued. So. Right. I would think. And withdrawing without a really reasonable prejudice. This is the thing that it sounds like the same as court just fails to realize that there's an S that withdrawing involves you know taking steps to avoid reasonable prejudice, right? So um, so yes, and that actually leads right into the comment made by um, LACPA, which was also a good comment, which was we say, okay, well you might have to withdraw, and then what happens if you if you can't if if the court denies your application to withdraw and say you're even in the Zeno situation? Now you've got to proceed with a case that you think is meritless. The court hasn't let you out. Is it really possible, in under any conception, that you could still be number one liable for malicious prosecution in that case? Although we don't have a case on it, Zeno just takes us right there, but doesn't finish. And, or that you could be violating ethical duties or anything else. But, but Lo Los Angeles was concerned about the, the concept, even in our opinion, where we say, look, you know, there are circumstances under which you, know, you can try to settle. Sometimes you can't. If you're concealing information, you just have to get out. But, but we just kind of assume in the opinion you can get out. But what happens if you can't? And do we really want to be saying to people, look, if, if you can't settle, which is what's in our opinion. Under certain circumstances, you can't settle because you're concealing information that should have been revealed. And you can't get out. So now we're telling people you can't settle. And you can't get out because the attorney, because the, the court wouldn't let you out. You've got to prosecute a claim to conclusion, but you can't settle it. And you know it's meritless. It seems like a strange result. I've seen it happen. I was in trial against a very, very litigious person. 13 malpractice case. They had they suck, suckered a lawyer number six into the case. He's after the first week of trial and he's heard the evidence. All of a sudden the lights go on. He tries to get out, but he's in trial. The judge did not let him out. And so, what's what does he take home from that? It's he's not acting maliciously. It may not be a tenable claim, but he tried to get out, and the judge didn't let him. So from a malicious prosecution point of view, which is not our domain, he's relatively safe. From a ethical point of view, that's a, ten that's a tension that I don't know that I've ever thought about. You've tried to do the right thing ethically, but the court won't let you. It's judicial rulings from the ethics. Well, it kind of raises the lying client um, scenario from that opinion. You know that you you you've tried to get out. You know that there's you know perjured testimony, um, and in that circumstance, you can you have to continue, but you're not allowed to refer, of course, to the perjured testimony or lie on it in any way. And so I wonder if this is that same kind of situation where, in our opinion, re remember that. 
that in, in our opinion, we're saying there are circumstances where you can't settle it because you're, it would be based on concealment of information that should have been disclosed. So assume that, that you're, you're in that world. It's similar to the lying client. And then you try to get out and you can't. I, I don't think it's too much of a stretch for, for us to conclude that, yeah, you, you might have to stay in to trial. You, you can't rely on or use the concealed testimony or you know, information. Um, but yeah, you, you might have to finish, and, and I think that would be consistent. Right. Um, but, but it is something we should mention in the opinion because it was left open, and Lacqua pointed it out, and some other people. And I thought it was a good point. But does that, is anyone uncomfortable with coming to the conclusion that if you're in that position where you can't settle, you try to get out, you can't, and now you've got to take it through trial, and now you just can't refer to. Whatever the reason was that you couldn't settle, the, whether it was concealed, um, concealed, you know, something that should have been revealed that wasn't, or something that was false that you find out about, that you'll just have to take it to trial, but you just can't re rely on any of that uh, information. Is anyone uncomfortable? You're going down a slippery slope, yeah. because I'll give you an example that I faced that would have been awful if the court hadn't been really granted relief. Concealed. Lawyer knows this client has written a note that absolutely destroys the case. The client will not give it to him for discovery, but he's seen it for she. The judge won't let him out. He now has to try the case knowing that there's evidence in the client's hands that will turn the tide of the case. Is he putting on a fraud? by putting the client on the stand. It gets real tricky when it's concealed information. That's the problem I have. If going, if going down that path, you will know, we'll have to think about a lot of scenarios. Well, concealed evidence is real tough to deal with. Right, it is its, its own thing. And sometimes these issues come in and, and um, end up de derailing the, the <laughs> <laughs> end up derailing the opinion, which is really about whether you can settle a case if you think it, it's it's meritless, right? So, so while I think it's important to address, you know, it uh, you're you're right. You can get involved in, in this whole theoretical um, discussion, but at, at the, the end of the day, I think if if you try to withdraw and you're not allowed to withdraw, I, I think it's really tough to say that the lawyer is acting unethically thereafter by proceeding. However, if they then start, you know, putting on a, a, a case and referring to perjured testimonies, so they, they obviously can't do that. And it, it is a lot like in that situation. That's it the goes off issue. In a lot of directions. I literally had a client once show me a note that really hurt their case, and I said, "This really hurts your case." I grabbed the note and said, well, "You're never going to touch it again." And I said, "No." I mean, this is a long time ago. I didn't know. And so we ended up having a big discovery in that on Because it was in federal court, we turned it over. We asserted privilege and let the judge read it. He did what he did with it. But the client hadn't given it back to me. And I had no clue what I was going to do. So what's interesting there, and this is another form, another group of, a, of the public comments that we got on this type of issue is, OK, well, you might think that that kills your case. Yeah. But guess what? Haven't we exactly. all put, you know, cases that we think are rock solid before a jury and they just don't they don't believe it or they just take it a different way. So when it comes this is the issue with evidence. Like you really don't know what someone's gonna think is important. What you think is the most important document in the whole case, the jury doesn't even look at, you know, potentially. So so that's what's hard about that. You know, are you perpetrating a fraud? Maybe not. You're just putting on the best case you can with the evidence that you're permitted to, to present. And then you know it's it's out of your, your well, hands. Well, the fraud would be failing to disclose evidence to your adversary when you've asked for it too. Uh, it, whether it's exculpatory or not, if your client says you can't have it, it's a problem. And now you're perpetrating fraud on the other side of the litigation because they've asked for it. You haven't given it to them. The client doesn't give it to them. It's weird. There are lots of permutations. I agree with that, and I also think that Suzanne's kind of, you've got to be careful about 
how far down the rabbit hole we want to go. I mean, this is a very interesting question, and it's correct that our opinion sets up a scenario, and if something didn't go a certain way, it could leave the lawyer in this conundrum. But talking about what you do with that conundrum seems to me almost like an entirely new opinion. Right. Right. Um, and I. I, I just think whatever we say about this, we got to find a way to not, I, I don't think it's productive in this opinion to chase that down, quite frankly. And I also think it's not a perfect analogy, but those kind of conundrums, I mean, sometimes, the, I mean, are they really acting unethically? I mean, we could debate that. We could spend days debating that. But I mean, in some ways, to me, it's a little bit analogous to like, um, there are situations where the court tells you you have to do something and you do it, even though you're trying to protect your client's interests, maybe through an ethical obligation. I'm thinking of like privilege, right? And there's a doctrine that says, if I end up producing something pursuant to a court order that's privileged and I fight it and the court disagrees with me and I have to produce it and ultimately I prevail on appeal, is there a waiver of privilege? I mean, technically, maybe yes. But the law is basically no. I mean, if I was forced to follow a lawful court order in doing that and they were wrong, the fact I complied with the order at the end of the day doesn't take away the protection. It's not a perfect analogy, but I mean, I think in some of these situations, you know, if a court tells you you got to do something and you got a competing ethical obligation and you try to do the right thing, there's an avenue for you to do the right thing and the court won't let you out then you're in a, an awful position and you've got to do the best you can with that. But for someone to say really in this sort of general abstract way, well, you're still in the case and even though you're not actively you know, promoting some, some particular piece of evidence or something, you're theoretically you know, acting unethically because you're pursuing a claim in a, in a, in a sort of general sense because you're still the counsel and that's the underlying claim for, you know, for liability even if you're not talking about it or not talking about it. I mean, I just, it's, it's all very interesting. <laughs> I, I don't think this opinion should go there. Yeah, Steve. Well, one more three cents, Steve. All right, just, just, uh, uh, Suzanne, I, I think that, you know, the, the, I don't see anything in the comments that really impugns the basic structure of your thinking about this and the way you've set it out. It feels to me it's more a matter of clarifying the line of analysis and of maybe stepping away from some sinkholes. Right. Right. Um, it feels like the one that, that both the withdrawal piece and the sort of the question of when undisclosed information would prevent you from settling um, are, we could, we could, uh, we could, those are generic questions. We could flag the existence of those questions, even in footnotes, without going anywhere with them, and without, without, you know, so saying so long as you don't have the, uh, the fraud through non-disclosure problem, so long, and, 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 you know, so forth. I mean, that'd be the sort of a way to do it that, that would uh, back away from some of these things and uh, but keep your basic point, which I think, I think is right. That makes sense as a way to approach those, those particular ones which were potentially, you know, going into a different, complete area of substantive law on its own. They're all standalone, they're both standalone issues, I think. Um, so I, I, I think that's a, that's a good approach to that. Um, and it was sort of where, what I was thinking, I do think we should probably do a little work around Samos and just a little bit more clarifying what we think the holding of that is. And I'm interested, Marshall, in that in Ray Marr to case. Um, That's, so he actually he, cites it, he called it R-M-H-O, okay. okay. Helsley. That, um, that's just basic law and uh, Latin versus woman care. Those are cases that typically arise in the divorce context where the client says, my lawyer went into court and settled, but I never agree. And then you talk about procedures to secure the court satisfaction that the client, in fact, was aware of and settled the case. And they basically say a lawyer has no authority to resolve substantive issues in the client.
Johnson's case with the help of the consent. There's one of them is a Supreme Court case. So I, I can get you those sites if they're not old. Yeah, I, I, it sounds familiar. I'm not sure I have them somewhere in my, in my stash. Um, so, that, so that was Pardon a big part of the substantive comments. The, the, the other thing, th there's one more very substantive thing, which we'll, we'll talk at the very end. But um, the, the other thing was uh, a couple of people made the point, well, does this apply to defense as well? What if your issue is that you have a meritless defense? And um, I think it would apply, and I don't think it's like a whole you know, revamping of the opinion. It's more like a footnote somewhere that you know, this would apply equally to you know, if you're putting on a meritless defense. Um, because the idea is that that would then reach a broader range of. of um, what does that mean you can't set, but the not settling has a different kind of meaning there, doesn't it? Well, you know, I mean, if you're settling, presumably you're going to be paying some money. So why can't you wait? So I think I think the idea is, um, if you are in a situation where where you find out your your client's defense completely lacks merit, could you first of all be in a position where you have to withdraw? And I think we could probably agree yes. Like there's no magic between the difference between a plaintiff and a, and a defendant when it comes to ethical duties. Um, and then, you're, you're right, could you settle, is, is kind of a funny question there, it's like you settle for full damages and then you're fine, you know. Um, so it, that is probably less the question about whether you could settle as much as it, you know. People were saying, you know, is this, is this a conundrum that will only approach plaintiff's lawyers, the, this idea that you might have to withdraw or ethically withdraw if your client's faith, case lacks merit. And, and I don't think that that issue is just plaintiffs. It can also be a defendant. But the rest of the opinion about whether or not you can settle doesn't really have any application to it. I'm completely convinced of. by this. I mean, I just think, I mean, I'm not sure that I know the answer, but I would want to think about it more. There is a huge difference between someone who brings a claim and someone who is sued. And, um, and you cannot be maliciously prosecuted for that you, you can't bring a malicious prosecution against someone for raising a defense that had no merit, right? Oh, I mean, right, but... I, no, I, and then yeah, that's not the end of the story, yeah. but I just think, I would want to think it through. Like, what is, what is the, um, what is the meritless defense that you, therefore, would have to feel you would be in a situation you need to withdraw? Because in both cases, a fraud is being perpetrated on the court. I don't mean why. I, I mean, right. I want to know, like, like a scenario. Isn't it a broader issue? Can a lawyer fail to disclose to an adversary where they have a right to know a fact material to the resolution of the case, whether you're a plaintiff or a defendant? Let me no, give you an example. Because, because, <coughs> that's, that's the second yeah, piece of it, though. It, because the first list right. starts out saying, we assume that everybody has the same information. Okay. Right. right. We don't, we don't. So, so in that what situation, um, you, I, I just, I mean, I literally, I don't want to take your. San Francisco bar, bar ethics may have a big problem with this. This right. is one of the issues. Um, with and what? with whether it applies to a plaintiff's lawyer or a defense lawyer, because right, you know, the plaintiff's lawyer is the one who the claim. Um, and I think mostly what the San Francisco Ethics Committee was saying is not that they disagree with the conclusion, but just that these facts need to be tightened up a lot and it needs to just be made clear. So if it's going to apply to both plaintiffs and defense counsel, I think, yes, the overall point of um, you know, if you feel you're in a bad position or you don't agree with something that maybe you can withdraw, but as but then you move into the settlement part, and you're, yeah, it doesn't really get to the defense counsel right. at that point. Right. Which is why I agree. It's sort of, if anything, it's sort of a footnote on the first piece about where we're discussing you're in a mandatory withdrawal situation. Because, you know, when you look at the rule, I mean, the rule says if the client's bringing an action, conducting a defense. Um, you know, the permissive grounds, insists upon presenting a claim or defense that is not warranted. So, you know, the rules are agnostic as to, you know, who's doing this, what side you're on. But I agree, it doesn't really go the, the next step. And 
the, the point of, of the opinion was to sort of find the lawyer in that position where they're in a mandatory withdrawal situation. And so there are other groups, um, BASIC was one, and there are others that sort of got, not, I don't want to say caught up, but distracted by the, the lack of information, you know, the, the lack of facts that would establish that you're in this mandatory um, situation. I, I think the best way to do this is say, this, this opinion is not about all of the circumstances under which you might find yourself in a mandatory withdrawal. This is just, we're trying to give an example. This could apply to plaintiffs, defendants, that, you know, there are the different facts, you know, you know, but I, I get the point. The, the point, because a lot of people felt that, you know, a few, you know, comments came in that these facts don't tell me that you're in a mandatory withdrawal situation. And it was kind of, well, we were kind of trying to avoid even talking about that part. We wanted to assume you were there and then talk about what you can do. But, but, uh, but I take the note that I think we need to do something to explain what this opinion is really trying to get at and that, you know, we, we want to assume that you're in that position. This is one way that you might be in this position. Defense lawyers could also be in this position for different reasons. You know, maybe something like that we can. Well, what do you do with the second piece of it? I mean, I mean, the rule, as you indicated, the language of the mandatory rule speaks to, you know, asserting uh, a defense, conducting a defense without probable cause uh, and for the purpose of arrest. Could, could you speak up just a little bit? Sure. I'm just reading from the, the mandatory withdrawal rule, and it does you know, speak to conducting an offense. So it's easy to say, drop a footnote and say something like, you know, this is one scenario, what have you, and make the point that, you know, the rule does speak to, you know, addresses the following things which include defense and basically have the language of that. But where does that leave, I mean, I think the troubling part, and I agree, the part that seems different is when you get to the second part, and, and you're saying we want to, we, we always intended to start with, you know, this is mandatory withdrawal, not get bogged down on, on why we're there, but have that as sort of a launching pad, okay? So that takes care of that, but when you get to the settlement part, what do you do with the, I mean, I, I'm just trying to understand what the proposal is to address this point that people are saying, how does that work for the defense lawyer when we get to the settlement component? Is your, is your opinion the same analysis? Are we gonna say, are we somehow saying, we're not really getting on this is just one example. I'm just trying to understand how we're covering that second point, if at all. This is just a brief comment, which is that I also don't think we need to feel as a committee compelled to write different opinions than the one we've written. I mean, if we get something wrong, we need to address it or unclear. But like this this is an opinion about a plaintiff's lawyer in this situation and what uh, he or she does. So it's it's all it would also be possible to just decide. And I, I don't just, I'm just trying to clarify for purposes of what so, we're, I mean, maybe right. the answer is we're going to say this is, you know, one scenario. We're not trying to cover everything. And we point out that the, the withdrawal rule does speak to, you know, asserting claims and defenses, whatever. But we're saying that, hey, this is just the scenario. And it is what it is. I'm just trying to. Right. I mean, it, it could be that, that you say, you know, this also would, you know, a defense lawyer can find himself in the same position of mandatory withdrawal. You know, of course, whether or not, uh, of course, there, there would be no bar on settlement. I mean, it's so obvious. Like, yeah, isn't right. it kind of obvious that, you know, it's like we're not going to write a whole opinion about whether or not you can settle it, right? So, so you know. That's what you would do if you had a bar. <laughs> 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 Let's say you get to settle it, or I can represent you and put up, you know, and, and make I'm a sorry, meritless. I'm sorry, we can't end this. You have to go through the trial. <laughs> right. Confidence, <laughs> judgment. Confidence yeah. probably dictates that you must at least try to settle. So, right. but, but it's a good point. So maybe we just sort of preview it saying, you know, of course the analysis of settlement, you know, is, is not really presented in, in that scenario, right? It, the, there's no ethical conundrum. I mean, presented actually, for the defense lawyer. Actually, you could more find yourself in the stuck in the case scenario as a defense lawyer mm -hmm. because you know you, it would be very likely that you'd have a crap defense. The plaintiff's not going to let you out. They know you have a crap defense, and the judge, you're in trial. Mm -hmm. So that so you're more likely to be in the martial conundrum mm -hmm. of, of, of right? that different of, conundrum. You know, right. of you can't you don't you can't put on a fraudulent defense, but. So anyway, but the, the question here is whether you can ethically settle, and that's the question, and it doesn't exactly apply right. to a defense attorney yeah. point in this situation, so I think it is limited to a plaintiff's attorney yeah. 
um, obviously there would be different issues that a defense attorney would face related to these, you know, withdrawal situations, but I don't think it would relate to whether they could ethically settle, because I think we'd probably all agree that they could settle the case. All right, so I think that's a good point. And then the, the last one, which was is, is a big one, is one we struggled with, and a lot of people came back with it. Um, th there was another point about whether or not we should go here at all, but um, Andrew Tuft had a good way to address that. Um, that comment from San Diego, so uh, we'll see how it goes in the next revised draft. But um, money, everyone wants us to opine on whether or not you can settle for money or not. Tell us, people. That's what we're getting, that we don't want to be left. Some people read the opinion as saying, of course you can settle on whatever terms you want. And other people say, oh no, I see this as, you know, you can only get a release. So either we should clarify, like we're not weighing in, but don't leave it open so people can have either one other uh, interpretation. So, so one option is to say, look, we're not weighing in. You know, good luck with that. Or we try to go there. And so again, the issue is whether or not, when you know your case lacks merit, and you may even have to try to settle to avoid, you know, foreseeable adverse consequences to your client. Can you settle, you know, on terms that involve the payment of money from the defense? That's hard to see that as a serious issue because the answer seems obviously yes. I mean, what if the other side presumably has all the facts they're entitled to. They can determine whether the case has merit or not, and that all enters into the calculation. And in order to get the deal, the client is probably going to want some money. And so if the other side's willing to offer some money because it's cheaper, or for all the reasons people settle, they can consider it a nuisance settlement. It's a bullshit lawsuit, but we get rid of it. We save money. Well, I don't see the ethical issue. As long as we're allowing, we're saying you can ethically settle the case, why would we draw an artificial line that can't include money? That doesn't make sense to me. Is there any principled way we could distinguish between a release and some affirmative relief. I don't see it. I, I, sh I share your view, so I don't know if I can uh, articulate, um, but what, what, what I've heard um, spoken around this issue, and, and I would love for other people's input on, on this as well, is something along the lines of, it, it's just unethical. It becomes a shakedown, basically. If you know that you've got a meritless claim, it, it just becomes a shakedown, that you're trying to just get money for nothing. And that just is unethical. Like, you know, just from like the unethical with a little e, I, you know, I don't know, and, and a hyphen, I don't know. But it, it does feel kind of unethical to shake down people when, you know. But but I do think it's different when you, you know you have a meritless case from the beginning, you file it anyway just to try to shake money down, versus our scenario, which is you filed it, you thought you had a big case, you're moving along, and all of a sudden you, you don't. It's an important reason, though, why we we included in these facts that there's a level playing field in terms of knowledge, mm -hmm. and and that is a big part of why this is in there at all. Because you know, I, I don't know if you can settle if you're withholding information. You certainly couldn't, you know, accept money because the other side doesn't know what you know. Is there an ambiguity in our in our framing of what it means to have exactly the same knowledge? We're, I mean, in, in our scenario, the attorney has learned something, right, which, which persuades them that the case is, whatever you want to call it, utterly and completely without merit, right? The door is closed, and the door is closed to further representation. Does the other side know that the case is utterly and completely without merit, or do they simply know all the facts that we were illegally required to tell them they knew to that point, know. right? You know, in other words, have, do, do they know the fact that tipped us into the view that this is completely unwinnable, right? Do they know all the facts that that have led, led us to that? But just to or is it simply the case that we haven't? We've learned some fact that we aren't yet under a legal obligation to disclose. Yes, they right. They haven't asked the right that one. That one. <laughs> the, the two cases. That one. <laughs> the, the, the first. The first case. Uh, you know, where, where everybody knows exactly the same facts. 
sounds, yeah, for all the reasons that Richard is saying, it, it seems, why would we care, yeah. right? <laughs> they have whatever their reasons that they have for doing the deal uh, is. But the other case feels right. a little trickier, right? Right. We're, so, not, we're not in the fraud situation. Right, so, as so, such, right. right. So right. that's because where because we don't have a legal obligation to disclose yet. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And that's where you get, you know, Ellen Pansky's um, comment was really geared around that. Like, look, we have no no duty to tell anybody. We don't have duty to tell our adversaries. We don't have a duty to do their job for them. We, this is an adversarial system. You know, take your best shot, and that's what that's what we do. And I think all of that is right until you get to the point where you had a legal obligation to disclose something and you don't disclose it, and so now the other side is operating under um, a, a different impression based on something you did, and that is different. You did not disclose information that needed to be disclosed, or you disclosed something that you now know is false. Um, and so that is different, and that's where I, I think Alan's comment, for example, sort of misses the second piece of 2013-189, which is that, yeah, you don't have a duty to, to tell your adversary uh, and do their job for them, unless you're the one that caused the adversary's misapprehension. And so when, when that's what we're trying to create in this opinion, that if you're not in the situation where you created the, uh, the adversary's misapprehension, then you can settle. If, if you are in a situation where you created the adversary's misapprehension. You can't settle at all. And so the question is, if you're in a situation where you can settle, is there anything that stops you from settling for, for money? Because we're assuming everybody either knows the same thing or hasn't done their job. Well, well it's not necessarily well, hasn't done their job. To, get, to find out what you know through the discovery process. Or it doesn't even matter, assuming the facts as we put them in this opinion, doesn't even matter what the other side believes or thinks. Maybe they you know, haven't caught on to it yet. But there were many people in the San Francisco bar that were very passionate about this point in that if you know your case has no merit, which is what the facts are telling us, then you in good faith cannot settle for money because that implies that there is some merit to that case. So the only settlement you'd be allowed to do in that situation is a walk away. Yeah, Many I mean, people, people have said that, that. yeah. I, yeah. People yeah. have said that. So then that's that's a good point. Is there an implied representation? And number one, are, are we responsible for implied representations? But is there an implied representation that, that your case has merit? similar to settling a case where your client is, is deceased and you don't disclose that. So, so the ABA has, has opined that that is misleading to settle a case where your, your client has, has died and you don't tell the other side. And in like a personal injury case, for example, where you know, future earnings and things like that would probably be relevant. So um, in that kind of situation, because it, it, settling implies that you have a client that's alive. So does settling imply that your case, for money, imply that, that your case has merit? I mean, what, what do people think about that? I am uncomfortable reading in a bunch of implied representations by the lawyers that go beyond what's set forth by statute with respect to your No, Drew, can you speak up? I'm sorry. Very quiet See, I need, I need the yeah. <laughs> It's the part I said, I'm, 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 I'm uncomfortable reading out of the blue, sort of a bunch of implied representations from lawyers beyond things that are well established, like statutory provisions that deal with our pleadings and the types of representations we're making. I realize ethics is, is slightly different, but again, I mean, just kind of creating this notion that from this rule that doesn't talk about it, a lawyer somehow is, is making some kind of implied representation. I, I don't know. I, that troubles me. <laughs> Um, I do think, um, you know, if you step back, and I realize, you know, the whole crux of this is that we have, you know, we're, we're starting with a launching pad where we have a claim that has absolutely no merit. But I mean, if you take it out one step back, just for a second, you could know of all sorts of favorable evidence to the other side that could you know, maybe torpedo your case, 
your case might not be meritless, but it could be realistically the end of your case. It could be the note or whatever that Marshall was talking about. And you could know about that. And you don't typically have an obligation, unless it's through process and procedure, to make the other side aware of, of that information, right? To the detriment of your client's case. And if we go into a settlement and you, you don't know about it, um, I can ask for money. And I could realistically be sitting there thinking, I have, I now know I have one of the weakest case. I thought this was such a great case. It's not meritless. But boy, if they go to X, Y, and Z, we're toast. And I can go into that settlement, and I can accept money to settle that case. Yeah, but it's and saying it's meritless in this opinion. I know, I know. Right. And so I, I stepped at that. But I mean, under the same concept, if you are not actively, if you're not concealing anything, if you're not preventing them from knowing anything, and you are not affirmatively using that any information that would be fraudulent or misrepresentative, et cetera, how is it different? I just pose that question, number one. Number two, I would say, I just think, you know, to the point about settlement that you're making, I mean, I don't know. I mean, people settle for so many reasons. I mean, the notion that somehow every time a defendant settles, they're, they're reading into and relying that would be the concept, right? Sort of some reliance on a representation. They're reading into and relying on a representation from the other side that their case has merit. I mean, I think a lot of people settle cases they think have absolutely zero merit for a lot of different reasons. And, and, so, and, and they have a right to do that. Yes. Yeah, they, yeah, they, yeah. People have a right to overpay. Well, yeah. Yeah, but we're talking about on the plaintiff side, do they have? I mean, I, I don't disagree, and I, yeah. I am persuaded by this discussion even more than I was before that I don't see a line. But nonetheless, it's, it's not about whether the defendant has a right to overpay. It's about whether the plaintiff's lawyer, knowing the case is meritless, has a right to accept the overpayment. But, but under this, if I look at the opinion again, if you check all the boxes, which is the client didn't perpetuate or cause the misunderstanding, the lawyers concluded that the uncontroverted facts, that's, that's the way it, this, this is now written. And, and you decide, we didn't, the other side apparently doesn't appreciate that. That the facts are on are uncontroverted, right? I think that's 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 implicit here, and they may have arrived at that lack of understanding through their own ineptitude. And if that's true, and you're, you 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 can delightfully and ethically have them have them overpay if if you're the plaintiff's lawyer. That's the way it works. You haven't caused them to be inept. Right? I can, I, can I just pose, pose the question? Do you think that's true? Suppose, I mean, the, the, I say, it feels to me like this is a very narrow, the, the cases that are giving us pause are a narrow set of cases. It's where you've learned something that irrefutably shows the lack of merit of your case. And I, the other side, is so stupid, they don't understand it. Or you're not yet under an obligation to pass that information on. Right in some way, yeah, not I mean, yet. Why? Because we, I mean, and this happens all the time in my experience, in my limited experience as a practicing lawyer. The, the reality is that all the time you find something that destroys your case, right? Before you have an obligation to pursue it, and you start settlement negotiations. Right? Um, and I mean, whether your case is totally destroyed is another question. But all the time, people are starting settlement negotiations in anticipation of being under an obligation to produce something that, and the other side kind of knows, right, that if the settlement negotiations start and all the requ legally required information isn't yet produced and isn't yet, that's a signal, right? So there's a certain, I mean, I think that it, if that's what we're talking about, if we're talking about a situation where you're genuinely not under, your client hasn't created the problem, you're genuinely not yet under an obligation to pursue it or uh, pr produce it, or it has been produced and the other side hasn't appreciated its significance yet, right? That's the case. That's the universe of cases we're talking about, and it seems really hard to say you can't settle for money in those circumstances. I think it's important for us to, to um, even even when our, our uh, even when our 
uh, target lawyer uh, who's addressed in the who's addressed in the opinion uh, does believe that um, he or she is obligated to withdraw ethically. Um, that doesn't. That's not an absolute in the sense that by itself it doesn't mean it has no settlement value to the other side. If indeed we have a level playing field, and I think this is exactly what exactly what everybody's been saying. If, if indeed we have a level playing field, and all the um, and all of the legal obligations to exchange um, information have been met, um, that doesn't exclude the possibility that the other side on that level playing field might not see some merit in settlement. And so long as we're acting consistently um, with um, 616, we're not doing any, anything that's um, any uh, discovery violations. And we're not before a tribunal where, you know, it heightens, it, it heightens the, the value for both parties. Um, in a settlement situation, uh, certainly the other side can see a settlement value in it, and there's no reason, no ethical reason why uh, our our lawyer can't um, can't engage in that. So does anyone disagree with with that premise? Of what I think that was well stated, and it, it is what others have been saying. So does anyone disagree with the notion that you could settle for money? We know some of the public <laughs> right from. <laughs> Right. San Diego probably would say, right, because they're saying you can't sell, right. period. Right. San Diego would say it sounds like a fair it's contingent on this. Right. But yeah. you're fairly representing what, yeah. Right. Although I will say that I think the point these members in my committee were trying to make is that if we're saying that you could settle for money, to put that in the opinion. Right. Just make it clear that it can be whatever that practitioner thinks is you know, appropriate and good for you. I agree with that. We do Just need to say it. one way or the other, right? Yeah. Or that we're not saying. Right? We, have, right. we have to be super clear that we're making the predicate points everyone has just yeah. kept making right, right yes. now, which is you know, we're really dealing with the situation where right. everybody, you know, they, they haven't perpetrated any you know, misrepresentation comply with all our obligations. Here's the weirdness, right? Could, maybe, or that, that, what if you had this information in your hands, right, uh, before you filed any claim, before any lawsuit was filed? Uh, can you write a demand letter based on it? Are we comfortable with the idea that you can write a demand letter uh, for a claim that you know to okay. be missing some critical piece uh, of the of, so of this, merit? And if so, why why is the answer different in the demand letter case, or in, if if not, right? Um, or do do we need to be consistent that way? I mean, th th well, this is the yeah. I think this is maybe the intuition that underlies the um, that underlies the. Um, The, the objection from the people who are saying you can't do it, right? Uh, you know, I, I, I certainly I wouldn't. I, my own advice to people would be you shouldn't write it. You you shouldn't write a demand letter in that situation. I, I actually I, I think the big difference is that you need to take steps to extricate your client from a pending litigation. Um, and from because you're going to have to withdraw. There are circumstances like Lacpa said. There are circumstances like they want us to say that there may be circumstances where you where you have to try to settle the case to avoid the foreseeable adverse consequences to your client, competence. There's a whole bunch of other things that come into play once you file the lawsuit um, that that militate in favor of settlement and even perhaps an ethical obligation to settle. I do think it's a completely different world writing a demand letter that you know for a case, that's just a shakedown in my opinion. Um, and I think that's unethical, but that's also not, not our facts plus. It, it, it seems like it's a gradient of concern because once you've taken on the representation, you now have to comply with not abandoning or prejudicing your client under 3700. So you have a different interest now. It, 
you're not prejudicing somebody by not sending out a demand letter. You just say, I'm not your lawyer. But once you've taken on the case and you're and how far down the slope you are of that representation could impact what the prejudice might be. I'm having a little hard time hearing some of you, so I, I'm not sure I heard your question, but I think it's a really hard question for me to say a client, a lawyer should settle a case when they know there's a problem that is unknown to the other side. And I thought that's what our opinion said, so I, I'm not sure I understood what your question was. Um, I, I think it's possible that um, what, what the, the line we're trying to, to draw is why is it that the other side doesn't know? Okay. And if the reason why the other side doesn't know is because it's something you did that you were legally required to do, like disclose something in discovery or be honest, but you know, it, not perjure yourself or whatever it is, then you, you, you can't sell. But if the reason why the other side doesn't know something is because they just don't know what you know, they haven't done the right discovery, they're going early to a, a mediation knowing that maybe they, don't, they haven't done discovery and that they, they're willing to go even though they know that they haven't done anything to find out what the true facts are, those kinds of things. Um, then, then, then you can settle. I, I don't see an ethical reason why you can't settle. It, you know, and so that is, I think, the, the, the question. I interpret the opinion cause their lack of information. Right. And on the other side, they knew or could know. Yeah. That's the way I interpret the opinion. And as long as they know or could know, because the procedure gives them the option of discovery, whatever then you're not doing anything to deprive them of it, and they haven't moved, perhaps. Either they have moved, and they have the information, or they haven't yet moved, but they could. So that's the two parts of the reason. I, I see that because your paramount duty of confidentiality. I mean, a lot of times it's not a fact they don't know. It's a propositional law they haven't researched. So, I mean, that's available to everybody. And, and the facts say that there's been protracted discovery conducted in the case, so right. seemingly everyone has the information and whether they haven't analyzed it or they've analyzed it in a different way than the other attorney has. I mean, there's obviously a bunch of different situations which we right. can think of why they either don't know it or they do know it and they don't care because they want to settle it for other reasons which some people raised. Right. And then that you issue. don't get into that judgment call. Mm -hmm. I'm more comfortable as long as the lawyer had no role in creating the misapprehension of fact. Yes. That's a key to that. That's yes. absolutely yeah. essential key. Absolutely yeah. essential. And we will have to say, you know, make that as clear as we, yeah. we can and you know, underscore it. So it sounds like we have consensus that in the next so. draft we're going to try to tackle the kidney care in the world. Awesome. That's, that's it. it. That's okay. it. Thank you, everyone. That, that was, was super so helpful, helpful. Uh, especially yeah. given that not everybody it's has the room. material. So it's good. Synthesis of the issues. Um, so before we take our lunch break, uh, we'll do our election. And so Andrew's going to hand out the ballots again. The drill is fill out your ballot. Me and Andrew will collect them, we'll tabulate them, they'll come back and tell us the result, and we'll go to lunch. And I just want to say, whatever happens, thank you to Steve and Ujwala for your desire and willingness to, uh, to throw your names in the hats. And either one of you would, would make just an outstanding uh, uh, vice chair, in my personal humble opinion. So to clarify, you need to put your name on it and circle the individual or check mark clearly aligned. No hanging chads. Well, why is this right in hand? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's probably, I don't know. It's like a, a dark order. Yeah. You're free. Uh, what happens to these ballots? They are maintained. <laughs> And discoverable. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. It could be a request on the public record. No, it's not an honor. Public record that uh, it'll be so appropriately destroyed in conjunction with our <laughs> document retention schedule at the State Farm. Oh, I don't know. Is, that, is that part of the public record? Is it vote? It's not that. It's, I think if somebody would like Someone to know. Someone would ask for it. Like, oh, let's okay. say one of the nominees.
This is an official action of the committee. You are nominating next year's vice chair. We can determine how that was determined. And so, that, so this process is a little bit better than you know asking the verbal. Exactly. So we're trying to balance. No, I was the last one that had a left hand. Thank you. You want to go back here just to do it? So, yeah, that was fine. It's really not on the show. I have no idea. I don't know who's right. And we have a because it's like with the like we're going to have an election and everyone knows what And no people Right. There was a plurality. I wasn't at that meeting. Right. So I was like, yeah. Well, no, I know. But I know how to get on the outside. Maybe I didn't so then they have to do a Yeah. But really, Yeah. 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 Okay, everybody, uh, I like to have your attention. We quick, uh, we tabulated the votes and would like to congratulate uh, Steve Bundy uh, for being selected as next year's vice chair. And I also, unless you get something else, the lunch is here, right? So. Hi. Lunch is here outside. And congratulations. What's yeah. going to be? However you want to make it. Maybe one. I mean, I feel like we have yeah, to do it very much. Oh, you do? Okay. One fifteen. One. I'm sorry. I, I, I only meant I wasn't trying to get a reconsideration. I was just. If you, he has an idea. I have something. But Amy can, Amy can take that. Oh, really? Oh, one o'clock. One o'clock. One o'clock. Right. Prepare her for next year. Yeah, that's all right. That's great. That's great. That's great. That's great. That's great. That's great. That's great.
say that the point more I'll only show that I'll talk about because of the briefs because the briefs in this case really education all the actual group that you have to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Yeah, so um, that's what I was trying to say. Typically, it's in July. They might be changing the process. At least they're changing the process in terms of how it's presented to the board. I, I, I'm not entirely clear if it's also changing the meeting at which they're taking action. I, I hope not, um, but I'm not, I don't know the answer to that yet. All right. Um, uh, just really quickly, I mean, so the, the, the committee, the roster turns over um, with the quote unquote annual meeting held by the Board of Trustees. That's scheduled for the middle of September. So um, I would anticipate action by the board would have to take place by, at the very latest, that meeting. Because those board members turn over, and so do the committee members. Uh, the standing committee members of committees of the, the Board of Trustees also transition at that point. And so the first meeting of this group of the composition of the new committee would be the October 19th meeting and for you all, if that's helpful. Just to be clear for everyone, um, that means we have, uh, under our present this year and this composition, we have two more meetings. There's a meeting in August and a meeting in September. So it's a July 27. July and September. And September 7th, I think. Oh, I'm sorry, I said August, I meant July. Yeah. Okay. So July and September. Okay. Okay, thank you guys. All right, great. Um, all right, so now we're gonna move on to another item, which is in our agenda materials. It is not an ethics opinion, uh, but as Andrew mentioned earlier, the Supreme Court's uh, order included sending 1.2.1 uh, back to the Rules Revision Commission with some suggested edits uh, to the language of the rule, uh, most substantively uh, some edits to comment six, I believe it is, uh, which uh, you may recall has to do with um, advising or, or assisting a lawyer in conjunction uh, with matters or, or a law that may be in conflict uh, with federal law or tribal law. And so the Supreme Court sent back some edited language to the RRC. The RRC then had a meeting, uh, and Andrew explained this to some extent earlier. The product of that was RRC put out for public comment two versions, two alternatives, uh, two, two revisions, two potential revisions uh, to 1.2.1. One of them sim simply adopts the revisions as they came from the Supreme Court. The other represents some additional revision that RRC did uh, to try and you know, add some further clarification, make the language more readable, what have you. And I, I don't want to take a ton of time, but Andrew, I think you were there, right, during the RRC discussion? Yes. Yeah, so is the, there just that, or maybe, maybe a two or three second to the extent they articulated sort of what they thought their revisions were accomplishing over the, the Supreme Court's language that came back, maybe you can speak to that quickly. And then we, we'll dive into the actual uh, all one and all two, but before we get there, just to finish the, the thought process here. So our task today is that we as a committee want to comment on what RRC has put out for public comment, which is, hey, what do you like? Do you like alternative one, which is the straight language from the Supreme Court, or do you like alternative two, where we tweak that a little bit? And we, we have a limited window to comment on that to RRC which is gonna close between now and the next meeting. So this is our last and only chance as a committee to approve a letter that we will send to RRC with respect to our view of these two alternatives. And so we had a subcommittee that looked at this issue and, and talked about it and, and um, put together a draft letter for consideration of the committee as a whole, which is in our packet, and we'll get to that in a minute. But but that's our task, is to, to collectively weigh in and, and, and see if we want to approve a, uh, a letter that we will then send to RRC as part of its public comment. And then it will take all of its public comment and, you know, eventually send whatever it thinks is appropriate on to, uh, to the Supreme Court. Okay. 
So, so it's in uh, your agenda materials. Amini has put it on uh, the screen. Uh, there are several, so whichever one your eyes um, most comfortably uh, can locate, uh, I'll take a look at it. This red line represents the commission's changes to the rule as proposed in the Supreme Court's order. And uh, I don't want to speak for the Supreme Court, but uh, as I understand it, the Supreme Court's revision to the original rule as proposed was they wanted to make clear that the rule allows for a lawyer to advise a client in complying with other California laws that might, um, that's what I articulated, uh, complying with other California laws, notwithstanding the fact that the overall legal advice and service that the lawyer is providing um, to the client violates a federal law. So um, there's the discrete issue of can you advise a client on activities that are permissible under California law, notwithstanding the fact that that law or that um, activity violates federal law. And then may you also allow, uh, advise the client to comply with other California laws as part of that representation. And um, there are some other aspects that might be going on with this language as well. And so the commission agrees with what um, the court was attempting to do. Um, they simply attempted, and I should note, um, the liaison, Greg Fortescue from the court, was on the call during the meeting, so he was listening and participating um, in the uh, RRC's revision of, of the comment. And so the RRC, I think they used the language, they are simply trying to sharpen the points that the court, that they felt the court was trying uh, to achieve in their own revision. And so the example that's on the screen here shows the RRC's revisions to the Supreme Court's language. And as Drew said, um, the working group uh, reviewing um, the RRC's work uh, looked at the two alternatives, the one put forth by the court and the one put forth by the RRC. They're recommending a letter uh, that approves the uh, version drafted by the Rules Revision Commission. And um, again, on the screen you can see uh, the Rules Revision Commission's approach contrasted with the Supreme Court's language. So I, I'll say on behalf of, of the subgroup that looked at this and other people can certainly weigh in, but it, and I realize it may be a little difficult, it, it's, it's you know highlighted in red line, but some of the issues we thought about with the original language, meaning the language that was here previous to the edits by RRC was um, it seemed to be, it, it has this list of things you could do. You could assist a client in drafting, administering, or complying with California laws, et cetera. Well, part of that, the drafting and the administering sounded like lawyers who were involved in sort of the legislative process. Um, and the complying was, was the only thing in there that seemed to get at what you might consider your more typical lawyer, you know, who's who's representing someone in, in you know, the business, so to speak. Uh, when I say that, I mean, the, you know, the, the marijuana uh, issues obviously are something that come to mind in conjunction with this comment, but, you know, there could be immigration issues, there could be all sorts of other things, but taking just as an example, sort of the marijuana context, you know, the lawyer might just be approached, who is not a legislative, they're not involved in putting together any kind of laws related to it, but, uh, you know, a client comes in and says, I, you know, I, I'm in the business or the industry and I need legal assistance in certain ways to, to do various things. You know, the only one of those that really seemed to apply was, was complying. Um, and uh, well, then you had, you know, this California statutes, regulations, orders, and other state or local provisions that execute or apply those laws. And so one of, one of the questions that kind of came to us when we first looked at this language was, well, okay, it's pretty clear you can advise, but that always seemed to be the easier aspect ethically. The, the, the more difficult questions people were raising sort of historically are like, what about assisting? I mean, what about putting together a contract? What about helping them you know, do things to incorporate and run a business that is going to be regulated by these types of things. Um, and, and, you know, 
is this sort of clearly sending a message about what you can and can't do in that regard? And, and so that was a question that was raised. And, and, and um, one of the reasons that we, we tended to prefer the Alt 2, which was the Rules Revision Commission's uh, effort to take the Supreme Court language but build on it a little bit, um, they did do a couple things. I mean, one, they add to that laundry list interpreting. So that's another thing that really, that's not a lawyer who's drafting or put, putting together the law, but a lawyer is helping someone potentially who's in the business or, or what have you that needs this advice. So they added that, so it's, it assists the client in drafting, interpreting, administering, or complying. And then they said California laws, including these other things, but that, that's, in my view, better language. It's broader. Um, so it's California laws, not just complying with California statutes, regulations, orders, and other state or local provisions. They're basically saying California law that deals with this, even if it's in conflict with federal law, is something that you can, you know, assist the client in drafting, interpreting, and administering and complying. And really, the, the, the fundamental thing that, that they added, the RRC added, which we, uh, I don't think it's inconsistent with the Supreme Court's language, I just think it helps in, in, in being clear, is they added this language even if the client's actions might violate the conflicting federal uh, or tribal law. So it's just sort of making it clear that even if the conduct that your client intends to engage in is something that might violate a conflicting federal law, it is permissible for the lawyer to do what is identified here, which is assisting the client in drafting, interpreting, administering, or complying with uh, California laws. So, um, for those reasons, primarily, I think that the subcommittee preferred the RRC version just in the sense that it seemed to, to give better uh, guidance, a little clearer, but, uh, in a way that we, we thought was helpful uh, to, to uh, practitioners. Um, I, I will say, you know, some question was raised about well, what about, you know, assisting someone in a context that doesn't have a regulatory component. So like maybe they want a warehouse lease. And let's say they're in the marijuana business, they want a warehouse lease, they want you to draw it up. And there's nothing about the terms of the lease that is like going to be regulated. Like there's nothing special you have to put in there based on some regulation. But obviously you're helping them do something uh, you know, where they're going to engage in conduct that is arguably in conflict with the federal law uh, in, in a broader sense. And um, I thought what I heard uh, in terms of that coming up with the RRC, and I'll just pass it on, is that with this, I mean, number one, I think even if the client's actions might violate the conflicting federal law, sort of helps, or tribal law. But the other thing that, that some have said is that, well, that scenario, it wouldn't be a violation anyway, because the conduct itself, putting together that lease, is, is not something that's impermissible or otherwise illegal. I mean, they may be asking you to do it because they're engaged in a business that may be in conflict uh, with federal law in terms of, of, of whether that is you know, appropriate or what have you. But the act itself, hey, put together this lease that doesn't involve any kind of regulatory, regulatory uh, uh, overlay. It, it wouldn't it wouldn't be a problem anyway now I you know that's that's I guess one person's view but it, anyway between that and, and again to me I think the addition of even if the client's actions might violate the conflicting uh, federal or tribal law I, I just think that helps add some some clarity in that regard we were also cognizant of, of not wanting to put too much into the mouths of uh, the Supreme Court and what they it intended or RRC and so if you get into the actual letter which is in the materials you'll see that it is a, a fairly straightforward letter in the sense that we we basically say we like the all two version and we we like it because we think that you know it's uh, uh, it provides some useful clarification to practitioners and we highlight in particular that statement that even if the client's actions might violate the conflicting federal law, and, and, and that's it. 
we don't get into a lot of discussion about here's how we interpret the, you know, the proposed revision or anything like that. So it, it's pretty straightforward in saying we prefer the Alt 2. We think that RRC's made some some helpful sort of uh, uh, edits that just make you know provide some useful clarification to practitioners, and in particular that sentence and and, and that. So um, I don't know. That's anybody else on the subcommittee? Did, did I articulate our sort of uh, general review and analysis? I think that was it. So I, I'll just open it up to the group. I mean, I don't know how people feel about that or if they're strong views of the contrary, yeah. I agree. It could be tightened even further. Uh, I'm not suggesting we say it. I, I was hoping the original version would have said the lawyer may provide all appropriate legal services, including but not limited to drafting, etc. That would have been better even. But as it is, it does, it does sharpen it up. I like the even if clause. That's more punchy. And I agree with you. The subcommittee did a good job. I think we ought to just support <coughs> There's a, I will throw out, there was also an interesting comment, and I think maybe, I can't remember if this was raised in the full committee before or not, I think it was, but I mean, th this is, it's an interesting issue, it's not necessarily an easy issue, and you do have to look at it from the perspective of, you know, I, I mean, it could come up in a lot of different contexts. And of course, people think of the marijuana context right now, but I mean, there's a lot of ways where you could have a conflict between state and federal law. Um, and uh, some comments were made to the effect that, you know, maybe not having something that is so precise is actually a benefit, you know, that, that we, um, you know, that for lack of a better word, that maybe having a little bit of ambiguity or wiggle room is a good thing because this is really gonna, is to some extent maybe influenced by particular circumstances in which the, the rule has to actually be applied. And so uh, that's just another thing that I've heard come up in the, in the discourse about this. So other thoughts from any of the other committee members on the issue in general or the, the recommend? I think the subcommittee's recommendation is, is to go with the letter that's in here. Yeah. How does this compare to what the model rules provide? I just, I have studied this, just looking at it, it looks like we're essentially letting the world know California has one set of rules, the federal government has another, as long as we're complying with California law and our advice and counsel, we've got a safe harbor. Well, Colorado broke the ground. They, their Supreme Court adopted a similar approach. Well, I was just curious what the I, Marshall, I think they, nationwide. I, this is not a standard. If you're saying the, the model rule itself, I think, doesn't contain this comment. Right. To, to Richard's point, there are other jurisdictions that have taken a similar approach wherein the, as a comment, as opposed to the body of the text of, of the rule on aiding and advising, they've had you know, a comment, not exactly this language, but to, to this effect. But if your question is, is the model rule have this comment, I think the answer is no. Right. And a, yeah. a further, a further thought, and this is something we talk a lot about. It's pretty clear, you know. What they don't say right, is that you can assist in the violation of a federal law. That's what they're saying. No, they are. They aren't quite there. They aren't quite there. I don't think they're. They, 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 no, because they don't talk about the situation. They expressly don't talk about the situation where you're, um, right. where you're. Uh, a, Aiding and abetting. Aiding and abetting. They, so they, and, and, and I think that's very much by design. Oh, so, sure this is, sure. so this is, uh, they're, not, they're not going all the way. I'm not a sophisticated constitutional scholar, but the first time I read that, I, I was reading Trump versus Brown. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, exactly. I mean, it's, it's, and it's really immigration. Is it's not worried about immigration. Is it up to us to, I mean, that policy comment. Yeah. The other alternative one basically says it, but more inartfully. So is it up to us to draw a policy line or not? Well, well please recall so, or which the language language they're on. what they're telling us they're going to do. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't hear your last comment. But in terms, of, in terms of the policy question, I would point out, and I think this should be relatively persuasive in terms of worrying about the policy. Alternative one is the Supreme Court's language I sent back, the California Supreme Court's language, 
as sent back to the state bar for consideration. Right. And I had, I think it was intended to have the effect of alternative two, as I read it. Right. Yeah. That so we're not talking about changing the effect, but the language for clarification. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And I can't, the commission was careful about that. Right. That's all I wanted to do. Yeah. They acknowledge that and exactly. They yeah. wanted to not expand nor con this, retract from what was. Well, yeah. RRC and the board made the decision to include the comment initially Correct. going to the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court as, for lack of a better word, seemed to buy into the notion of the comment. They just tinkered with the language sent it back and said, you know, we want you to look at the language. They didn't say we didn't like it. They just said, here's here's a little bit of editing, right? So, and, and, and then RRC said, well, we think we can make it even a little bit more clear. And so now they're putting out both those versions for public comment. We're just commenting on that. And so from that perspective, we felt like we aren't making a policy decision. Right. That's well, been I made by the Supreme the Court, Court and, and RRC. And, it's just which one seems to be more helpful to lawyers in terms of being clear and having an understanding of what to say. So. And, and one, one last thing, because uh, Steve's comment is important. For the reasons that Steve articulated, that is part of the reason that we didn't want to get too into the weeds on it. I know, Richard, you said, I would like this even better, but we thought, we, you know, this has been carefully thought about by the Supreme Court and RRC. We're really just going to weigh in on one or the other, and we're not going to have a real complicated letter that tries to, you know, do a lot of banks. Yeah, yeah I, I was just going to comment that, you know, with respect to the, the policy issue, you do have to keep in mind that this is a disciplinary rule. So the federal government really has no business in the disciplinary rules for, for California attorneys. So it is an interesting issue. That's not a debate I want to really Right, engage. no, I know, but I, I'm mean, just saying that it, do like, have an obligation to abide by the Constitution. Well, well, no. the Constitution, I, well, yeah. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm just saying, it's a disciplinary rule, and I think that the California Supreme Court looks at it, they are in charge of lawyers in the state. And so, right. uh, that may be part of what's behind it. I, you know, I don't necessarily think they're saying go ahead and break the, the law. Well, yeah. I don't, don't want to get too far off the mark here, but part of this discussion did come up at the RRC meeting, and it was uh, highlighted by a member of the Office of Chief Trial Counsel that the lawyer is convicted of a federal crime. There, there's still a disciplinary process outside of this comment for which the lawyer might be subject to, to, to discipline. And so I don't know if that helps allay your concern. No, I but don't, there, don't have a concern. There are differences here. Know, know the scope of what we were or were not doing. I mean, whether I agree with it or not, it's not really germane. It's, if this is what they want, I think alternative two is materially clear. That's pretty much the issue for you guys. Yeah. Yeah. It's be like one or two. Yeah. No. I'm not on the Supreme Court. Do you want a motion? Yes. yes I move we support alternative two. Can I just, sorry, I didn't mean to interject, but I, I just have one one comment that I'm just kind of reconciling with, which is just that, um, and someone maybe can put my myself at ease about it, but just the, the language in, in B discusses like a lawyer may, and comment six is all about permitting in May, and then the last sentence it says that the lawyer must. And so, you know, they must inform the client about related federal tribal law or policy when there's a conflict. And I assume that that issue is discussed, and that's just really particular to this situation in which they would have this affirmative obligation, not to take it out of context. The prior <laughs> rule, uh, the rule as submitted to the lawyer shall uh, inform. I think the Supreme Court changed shall to must. Okay. And then the Rules of Vision Commission said, well, that's an affirmative obligation. And the comments is that, you know, where it's supposed to be. Um, under what subpart of 1.4 is the duty to inform best articulated? They did discuss all that, um, but again, careful not to speak for the rules of this commission. My sense of the conversation to that was they were going to defer to the Supreme Court's approach in editing that sentence. And so, you know, they said if there's a must obligation in this situation where there's a conflict, some people noted it would be obvious to the client that there's a conflict because that's why they're coming to seek the lawyer's advice. The sentence is unneeded. Um, but notwithstanding all of 
those types of conversations. Yeah, I just was like thinking about the context, being taken out of the context of any time there's a conflict, you have this affirmative obligation to say, well, there's also these other authorities out there that conflict with that. But I guess in a particular context where you're being consulted related to the fact that, you know, there yeah, is. So, so reaffirm that, yes, I can advise you on this California law, but you need to know there's theft that might be federal exposure. And then there's a tribal law that I don't know anything about, but you might want to get a consultation about that. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to question. The second. So we had a first motion to support uh, alternative two and send the letter as drafted. Is that right, Richard? Is there a second? Second. Okay. okay. Andrew Dilbert? Yes. Amy Bonzi? Yes. Kendra Basner? Yes. Stephen Bundy? Yes. Eric Sykes? Yes. Jason Fields? Yes. Matthew Liddell? Um, Joel Osman? Marlo Richardson? Dina Roche? Yes. Teresa Schmidt? Yes. Bouge Bala Singh? Yes. Richard Solomon? Yes. Stephen Sparta? Yes. Marshall? Yes. Thank you. Um, so for our next item, I want to move to uh, 12, 12 3 This is the advertising opinion that's out for public comment. Um, and you may recall we've had some discussion as a committee on the public comment already. Uh, and we had a subcommittee that was working on some revisions that came out of our discussion. Uh, Joel was heading that up. He, he submitted a revised version, which is in our pack of materials today. Unfortunately, wasn't able to be here, but I'm going to try to uh, walk you through what was done here. Um, so, uh, a couple of things. You may recall that there were there there was public comment that came in from the Orange County Bar Association, uh, and. Uh, Basically, all of those, some of them were, were by and large language issues, suggesting a little tweak of the language here and there. Um, those were basically incorporated uh, into uh, the revision. And uh, we walked through, through those at a, a prior committee meeting. Um, so those have been incorporated. Um, the other, uh, and I can, I can walk you through in a minute through through the opinion itself. But the other um, uh, substantive issue that came out of our prior discussions that, that is not in here in Joel's revision is you may recall that um, you know we had a number of comments that came in from uh, Josh King, and, and one of the things that we we thought we would look at a little bit more was a comment that he had with regard to uh, a phrase in the opinion and I'm looking at the red line that uh, Mimi circulated. Mine doesn't have numbers for some reason but um, page, page it's okay. It's the page three under the discussion in the first paragraph uh, part way down uh, you'll see there's a sentence that starts uh, Professional directory websites are available to members of the public and thus by definition are, quote, directed to any former, present, and prospective, close quote, clients, and here's the language, and concern the availability for professional employment of the lawyer or firm. Uh, and in Mr. King's comments, he sort of took issue uh, with that phrase, sort of saying that, you know, we breezily reached this conclusion that, you know, that they're available to members of the public and thus by uh, definition are directed to any form of present prospective client and concern the availability for professional employment. I, I think his, his concern I'm reading, you know, into his comment that I think was in large part that last part and he sort of went on to talk about, the, he mentioned that the New York opinion, um, the New York City Bar opinion, and the fact that, you know, he quotes them, they have this quote that says, given the numerous ways that lawyers use LinkedIn, it should not be presumed that the primary purpose 
of an attorney's LinkedIn content is to attract new clients for pecuniary gain unless it contains express language or other equally compelling evidence to support that conclusion. So again, you know, seem to be saying, you guys just kind of assume that this is automatically, you know, used for uh, uh, or concerning the lawyer's availability for employment and, you know, aren't there other ways that people could use this, et cetera. And my, uh, my memory of, of what came out of our earlier discussions was we would go back and look at that. We'd look at the New York opinion. Um, and, and that's one issue that, that Joel didn't uh, fold into this. And, and so I want to briefly uh, touch on it. But, it, you know, some of the, I mean, I guess one question is for the type of service that is identified here in this opinion, is it realistic to think that someone's using this kind of an attorney directory for any reason other than, um, you know, the potential availability of their services? I mean, LinkedIn seems to be a different animal than, than the specific scenario we have here. And while it's true that, you know, we're not trying to render ourselves obsolete or speak to things that, you know, don't recognize technology may change. I mean, is it really the same thing? And so, I mean, I, I guess an initial question is, do we feel like um, we have to respond to this notion that, hey, it might not be concerning the availability of employment, in which case there are ways I think we could do that, like instead of saying, and concerns availability for professional employment, we could say something like, you know, and if used to market, you know, uh, uh, the attorney services and concerns or stuff, but the question is, do we even need to get there? I mean, another option would be to drop a footnote, and this is something that came up that basically says something to the effect of, you know, this opinion deals with, you know, attorney directory services of the type that are, is outlined in the opinion. You know, and it sort of made this is not LinkedIn. This isn't, you know, trying to, uh, you know cover some other uh, service that may be substantively different than this that has a bunch of uses potentially uh, uh, that, that are not related to you know, the lawyer's practice or, or availability for uh, legal services. So that's the question, I guess. Did I got that right? Yeah. That's, yeah. I think that's, that's exactly right. I mean, I just, I think if my, my personal view is that Drew's suggestion of a, of, of, a, of a textual fix is okay, but it kind of it complicates the sentence. It creates some questions about is it subjective using to market or what does it mean to use the market? I, and I frankly think that that um, the letter is you know is kind of disingenuous. And you know, it is, of course, it's true that there are other online forums where attorneys might contribute, and you might say, is this used to market your services, or is this used for you know, exploring interesting intellectual ideas? But I don't think you can say that about a, a, a directory. So my thought is the footnote is the right way to go. Uh, I, one thing I would just add to that is I, I do, I agree with, with, um, with Amy, and the idea of putting it you know, to market your practice suggests that there's some other way that you could use the directory. And, I really just don't think there is. This is a directory of attorneys designed to be a place where somebody can find an attorney. It's, it, and that's what it is. And there are other things, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about an attorney directory and rating. What are they rating them on? They're not rating them on their interest in some theoretical, you know, like their social media presence. So I would say adding the qualifier makes it Suggests that there might be some other way. Yeah. Well, I, and we were trying to scratch our yeah. head, head saying, you know, well, what, how would someone use this that wasn't, you know, sort of related to their availability? His letter admits that that's what the service is for. Yeah. Yeah. Say that again. Opens, the letter opens with that very idea. The very right. second paragraph of the letter says, the opinion? given the access to the justice, justice gap and the chronic underemployment of lawyers. Right. Um, you know, you can do to have information about the availability of you know, the availability of information about lawyers, um, hiring an attorney if they could not get adequate information. I mean, right. the language of the letter Assumes. is precisely. I mean, he talks about how there's 
the surfeit of information about even the most banal of objects that people buy, but there's not enough information about lawyers. And so therefore, people are not hiring lawyers because they can't find the information that they need in order to hire the lawyer. So of course, his service is for hiring lawyers. So I agree with Amy that this is a disingenuous. Uh, and a lot of his citations, which I've followed up, um, have, you know, our commercial speech in such other contexts and non-regulated industries. You know, you can't cut launch apply them to lawyers who are restricted in so many different ways under the rules of professional conduct and what you can and cannot say, even in commercial speech, are more restricted than other professionals. And so I think that the letter doesn't address that problem in, in too broad a scope of uh, First Amendment rights without you know, in attempting to do everything all at once. So. Well, it seems, it seems to me one of the one of the challenges is that is that uh, it definitely almost definitely isn't LinkedIn. LinkedIn is much more generalized in this way. But on the other hand, uh, Amo, um even perhaps against its own state purpose for being, uh, it it states that uh, the website claims that it uh, has profiles for 97% of all lawyers in the United States. And uh, no, not all claim, to be sure, but that it, that it lists uh, that number of people. And if there are a lot of things that people might be looking for, or companies or entities might be looking for a lawyer for, it doesn't involve delivery of legal services. Um, Expert lawyers, for example, conservators, for example, things that both lawyers and non-lawyers could do, and they prefer to have a lawyer because they think lawyer skills might enhance it. In other words, whether or not AMA was created to connect with this consumer, with this consumer audience for to deliver specific services, what it has created is something that's much broader. And um, I I agree that we should either a footnote that that thing, or eliminate that sentence altogether. Um, because we, we don't tie it, uh, we don't need to tie it doctrine, doctrinally um, to anything. I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just thinking that Abo, uh, whether it means to or not, has created something that's a lot broader um, than, it's, than it's stated, a lot broader than it's stated. Which is. What's the proposed footnote? I don't know. Well, I mean, then don't you have a separate issue of how do the rules apply to a lawyer who's exactly because it's the role because of the conservator or exactly. lawyer who's, you know, I mean, like then we have the ancillary business problem. Exactly. The problem, problem is exactly lifts, lifts it out of the definition of uh, lawyer act that that's. That's well, except that authority the that's applied lawyer mm -hmm. advertising to law related services. Exactly. So, qualifying, so, so taking that sentence and qualifying it as you're discussing it, so Suzanne was discussing and Amy was discussing, might be, a better, might be a, a better way of dealing with it because it definitely isn't LinkedIn. And LinkedIn is much more general. It is like an online resume and, it, and lawyers can be on there and anybody can be on there. Uh, AVO is more specific and so it could be, could be read and believes itself to be very specific. But I do, but I do think that it, that it, I do think that it is more generalized than that, and um, so it presents Avo presents a lot of issues beyond the beyond the uh, profile, uh, which we don't, we're not dealing with here. Um, but in any event, uh, I, I do think we ought to qualify that a little bit because it's a little bit it's not as broad as LinkedIn, but it's still pretty broad. I think it should be broad. I mean, what, what, if LinkedIn, for example, is used to post a resume and you rely on your resume, and so that's a problem. And to the extent that people, and you're using it not just to necessarily attract clients, but other lawyers or professionals who might refer clients to you. So it's used more of a networking tool. But if you're lying in the course of getting that business, that to me is an advertising. Oh, absolutely. So I don't know why we want to narrow it. I think it's appropriately framed now to talk about when you are marketing your legal services, irrespective of the, of, 
of the form. I, mean, that, I, I think. But right. is that too broad? Or I think the the concern, as I interpret it, being stated in, in the comment, was sort of the jumping to this conclusion that it, it necessarily uh, concerns the availability for professional employment. And if you look at that quoted language from New York, which is talking about LinkedIn, which is different than our situation factually. They, they say, and it's true with LinkedIn, that you know there are other ways people could use it. There are, there are ways people utilize that service, and it's not about them wanting to get business or, or offer, you know, sort of advertise their availability to render professional services. And so I, I think the proposal is to try to have a little bit of, add a little bit of clarity by dropping a footnote here. And I think that, I guess the appropriate place would be after this sentence, right? Where three is crossed out, but we, we would have a footnote here. And so, I mean, what would it say? Um, I'm trying to remember that. I mean, had language we were talking about earlier. But um, I mean, I think the point is to, to, to make the point that this opinion deals with uh, an attorney directory, what's the language to say, direct, attorney directory website. An online attorney directory. Yeah, and then what, I mean, what do we want to say? Uh, oh. and, and, you know, not, I mean, not necessarily other online forums that an attorney might use. raising an issue before that I hadn't really thought about, but, and it's really not to Josh King's point or whatever. I, the, where it says concern, we, I think it is reasonable to say that a directory does concern the, the lawyer's availability for professional employment. Unless you're a public lawyer, though. I hadn't really thought, I mean, if you're a DA, um, you're not out there looking for employment. So technically, you know, we've said before that the advertising, you know, the advertising rules aren't triggered if you're not, whatever you're doing isn't for your availability as a, you know, a, a for employment. Now, on the other hand, maybe they're out there because, you know, they want people to know they're there and they might get hired away, but that's not the same as, you know. Um, so I never really thought about that, but we might want to. Well, you know, for attorneys in private practice or attorneys. Well, we, I'm sorry. I don't know. I'm just that makes me think. I mean, I think that's an interesting point, and it makes me think that maybe the qualifying language that Drew was suggesting is be is a better way to do it, which is. Um, Drew, can you? Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't perfect, but the gist of it would be. Um, uh, that's by definition are directed to any former president and prospective clients, and if used to market the attorney's services. And if used? Availability for services. Used. I mean, it's you yeah, know, it's specific to the language, but yeah. we'll just put it there so you see the point. If used to market the attorney's services, concern the availability for professional. I mean, it's it's not great language, I, but the, the concept I'm pulling from, if you look at the summary and other places in the opinion, that's the way we talk about it. We say when you're using it to market. So I was trying, that conceptually is consistent with the substance of what we say in the opinion. So I was trying to use that language as the qualifier somehow. To, but I don't think we do say that in the opinion. I mean, the opinion says, Claiming is one thing. Using it to market your your practice, even without claiming, is another thing. And both will, will bring you with, with it. So we, we kind of use 
using the profile to market your, your practice as something that independently will subject you to the rules regardless of whether you claim it or not. And then claiming as, as sort of ipso facto, you're using it to, to market. That's how I understand the way that this is laid out, and I think that that's generally true, except for um, unless you're a PA or somebody that's not actually available for you. Maybe we could just say, if, if you're in the category of people that's not available for professional employment, such as DAs, whatever, uh, this obviously wouldn't be the case for those attorneys or something. Well, I mean, you look at the digest and say uh, you're not responsible for the content. For a profile on a professional online directory or rating website maintained by a third party, unless she either exercises control over the profile's content by adopting her profile on the directory itself in order to market her practice, or by otherwise using the profile to market her practice, such as by posting a link to the profile on her own site. Um, Page three. It's the first full paragraph under discussion. About three or four lines up. I mean, I would say by definition, are directed to any. I mean, that seems not not controversial. It's really the and concern the availability for professional employment of the lawyer or the firm. It's interesting though because the language you just read from the digest again assumes that there's a way that you can adopt your profile for some reason other than in order to market your, your practice. And we were just sort of discussing is that really right. possible? Well, one, one of the problems is the profile may be wrong. And that's that's the, the quagmire that's the quagmire that uh, kind of presented. Um, one may adopt a profile not necessarily to mark one track. One might be, for example, uh, retired, or one might be engaged in, in something other than legal services. But on the, the, the information on the profile, as generated by by Avo, may be incorrect or just out, outdated. And somebody may try to claim, and that's where the, as a matter of fact, that for a couple of cases happen, may try to claim the profile for no other reason than to try to correct that information. And um, so, yeah, so the, my question, so my response is, yeah, there are alternatives. There well, might be other reasons to claim but, but, the profile. But we also talked about that, abandonment. You know, presumably somebody tries to adopt it to correct it if they're unsuccessful. <coughs> Then potentially going to abandon it, right? Well, no, it sounds like what Teresa's what, what is positing is an interesting idea. You, you're not, you're retired. You just don't like the fact that there's false information out there, or people are calling you and making fun of you because something on there is, you know, false. And so you just adopt it, you want to make it accurate, but you really had no intention of marketing your practice, you're retired. But from a client's point of view, why do we care? They're retired. No clients can be misled because, by definition, they're not going to take on their case. It's not it's a, that's not the question. It's whether or not practical. There's no practical. I thought we went over that scenario but a long time ago. If I'm adopting it, so you're going to say no? I can't represent you. I'm retired. So what's the issue? Client misunderstanding. That's not. Well, the point is whether or not it falls within the definition or not. That's all. As a practical matter, you know, it doesn't matter. But, but. The, all I think that, and Teresa, you know, correct me if I'm misstating it, but, but I think that the point is that that assuming that adopting necessarily means that you are communicating an availability for professional employment is the problem. Because it's not always the case. And actually the digest right. addresses that. Yeah. So, so maybe it is just to make it consistent yeah. later. Maybe by using just the same language in order to market her practice comes in where at, at the end of that sentence. 
concerning the availability of professional employment of the lawyer or firm it, if used in order to market if their used practice. To market the attorney services. I would just use the same language so people don't think it's anything different. If used in order to market the attorney practice. Okay. And I think that same that's a better maybe a better fix. That's what I was trying to. Yeah, is, is to take up the way we phrase it before. That qualification. So that's fine. Yeah, I think the qualification idea is, is a good one. Now that I talked myself out of it. Good language. You don't you want to be moving right to here? Or did you want it still? Yeah, no, I think it, you, I think it oh sorry, what do you think? Was it? Yeah. Oh. promote herself with availability for professional services. Is that what you're getting at, Regina? To, to some extent, add but, it to the, but I'll come back with my comment. I'm sorry, I lost my thread, train of thought. But I think that it, it really, okay, never mind. I'll, well, there's I'll a, come back. There's back. one or two other sort of yeah. points, and then that's it. So if you, Okay, so that was one thing that wasn't in Joel's revision that we intended to talk about. We talked about it. Sounds like that's mm -hmm. that's good. Mm -hmm. Good fix. We we can come back to it too, but I want to get the other two out. Um, so the the other uh, the other revision, and this is not something Joel left out. It's just. This is my comment, but on page four of the red line, in footnote four, he's added this footnote about how the opinion doesn't address um, fee-based rating services. And that was something a couple people brought up in the comments, or maybe it was the same person, but they brought it up twice. But someone said, hey, do you want to maybe point out that you know if there's a fee-based, you know, scenario what similar to this that implicates some other issues we realize that's not your fact pattern but since there are some of these things and so he put in uh, this footnote but I it just my proposal is to clean up the language um, and I think I would say something like strike the, the committee does not intend and just say this opinion is not intended to address fee-based 
rating services which may implicate uh, additional ethics issues. I don't think it's other ethics issues like you said because some of these issues would cross over to a fee base. I mean the point is fee base adds an extra layer of some issues that we aren't analyzing in this opinion. Right? When are we saying which issues are not ethics? But following your, what, what, on the face of it, this would apply to a fee base. If you pay your fee to be listed in a directory, why would yeah, that fee may, may not be included? Yeah. So, so the point is that if you had a fee based rating services, there are additional ethical issues that could Such be as, implicated, I think, right? It's Such as um, the prohibition on paying refer for referral referrals. Fees. And so there's been a few opinions oh, out there that say some so of these. So we can say that, We're such as. So I think given. we should do a such as. Well, yeah, that, that, that's fine. But that's the, the, the point was we're not addressing all the issues that could apply if it's a fee-based type of system. Um, so, okay, so this opinion is not intended to address fee-based rating services uh, which may uh, implicate additional ethical issues such as uh, what is it? The prohibition on uh, um, referral. accepting a referral fee, and maybe we cite a couple of the um, out-of-state opinions that have a on that. But this opinion does address fee-based directory. It doesn't. It, it doesn't address other issues. Right. That they That's right. It's not. What it's trying to say is this isn't a comprehensive analysis of a fee-based directory because it doesn't include a couple of additional issues that would be implicated if it was fee-based. So instead of saying the opinion is not intended to address, it said this is not intended to address other issues which may arise in fee-based directory systems. Such as? That's fine. Such as. Yeah, and it's actually endorsed. It's not referrals. Paying okay. for endorsement. So I'm just looking, and then there's a New York opinion and I think a New Jersey opinion if we want to stick it in there. Um, like CPG or so, but, but let's capture Richard's language. I mean, I think we should do, we need to do this in, in, in math. Okay. Yeah, okay. So what do you want to do? Let me pull up. So Richard, give us your language again. This opinion is not intended to address issues which may arise in fee-based Directory services, what does it say? Fee. Wasn't it? Other fee issues. services. Oh, sorry. Huh, sorry, in what? Fee based directory services? Yeah, directory. Yeah. Well, you the same word, just directory services or listings or whatever the word is. Um, such as. Oh, no, yeah. That makes sense. That, what was your yeah. example? Such as, Drew, such as. Um, uh, I don't remember what you said, but it was It's good. up there. Prohibition on well, accepting. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Prohibition on accepting referral fee, fees. referral fee. But, but Richard, oh. wouldn't we want to put, um, not intended to address, wouldn't we want to put other issues? I thought you had said that originally. It's, so it, it's not that this opinion doesn't address some of the issues that would be applicable. Other issues, yeah. It, it just doesn't address some other issues yes. that come into play with fee, fee, fee I fees. think that captures what Such as. as. That's, yeah. take it, that, I, that's yeah. really ambiguous. I kind of like, yeah, I kind of like the, the statement that it what, wasn't attempting to be a comprehensive analysis of all ethical issues, um, uh, all ethical issues um, relating to fee-based. Okay. I mean, you need this. Okay. Really? <laughs> well, so first of all, is fee based the right form, the right uh, term? Because I think what you guys are saying is AVO matches you to other people in exchange for a fee. Fee based could also be I'm going to pay you 100 bucks to give me a nine and a half star rating. So I'm not sure what the way this is currently, which we do address elsewhere in the opinion. For me, at first blush, reading this language, it's not clear to me we're clearly articulating the issue we're saying we're not addressing. And secondarily, I don't think we have to excuse everything we're not addressing in the opinion. The opinion should arguably speak for itself. And although someone may have made this suggestion, this, there is a ton of worms and many several different types of cans which can be erased with this issue. And if you're talking about New York Opinion 1132, 
1131, which tries to address the uh, matching aspect uh, and payment of fees for marketing services, we should not go there. And I'm not sure we're. Well, that that's my precise question. point is I'm not sure we're clearly stating what it is we're talking about. It's not clear. Either. Well, but your other point, which I think is a fair one, is that I mean, there's nothing that says we have to put in this concept. I mean, this was a suggestion by someone. Yes, it's true there are fee-based systems that are different than what we described, and yes, there are additional <coughs> issues that are implicated. But I mean, uh, maybe the better part of valor here is to not to try and go there. It sounds like we're starting to muddle things rather than clarifying at best. All it's it's kind of like dicta, you know, to something that isn't even our situation. Saying hey, there may be, it's it's issue spotting. There may be some other issues out there if it's a fee-based type of scenario. So, I mean... Do you remember why it was that that person thought... I, I actually I, I actually think it was in the OCBA letter. It, it's not me, but... Um, but I don't remember now why that person thought... My, my recollection was that they were concerned that it raised the possibility that um, People would think that if they comply with what's in here, they're they're okay, and there there's no other you know things to be on the lookout for. Um, right, we've been talking now. We've, we've been talking a long time without me. Not that I'm a standard, but wait, can somebody explain to me what the fee-based system would be? And you know, give the example of what the concern would be about, about an issue that would arise. Well, my my recollection. I mean. Uh, my understanding with is that yeah, Abo sure. has a couple of different services that they provide. One of them is that you provide a marketing fee, and and uh, in exchange they basically give you referrals and, or um, and no, no no it's not referrals it's to do with they specifically do endorsement not right. yeah it's, like it's, 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 it's to do with with the okay. Um, I'm just reading this. Uh, and offers to find the client the right lawyer with a money back guarantee. There is an implied recommendation. As, okay, so they're saying this is an article about this, so it is a secondary source. But they're saying that because Abo Legal Services provides ratings of lawyers using the service based on various qualifiers, such as years in practice, information provided by the lawyers volunteer bar work and other publicly available information and offers to find a client the, the right lawyer with a money back guarantee. There is an implied recommendation as to the lawyer's credentials, abilities, competence, character, or other professional qualities. That's the, that's, the, I mean, that's for the paid service. But if they're guaranteeing to find the right lawyer, that's an endorsement that you're paying for. If, if, you're, if you're so interested in it, there's like a slew of opinions around the country from other jurisdictions. A lot of them dealt early on with sort of the match concept, where where you know they'd have a limited pool of lawyers. You paid money to be part of that pool. They would direct the people using the service to that limited group of lawyers, and the concept was expressed by some that if you're paying money to be part of that pool, you are essentially giving something in return for a referral from a non-lawyer. And that that violated a certain right. right. If, yeah. if you're going to go to the footnote, I would recommend that you use that as the example so that the reader doesn't think there are all sorts of ethical issues that are quite closely related that we just decided not, not to discuss. Because <laughs> right. that, that's the relatively the same thing. I, I was thinking about, has anyone ever seen a call from somebody who says, I'm with Forbes and I want to do a profile on you? You're really excited, and you find out that it's like they want to try. Don't turn the camera. <laughs> that, that they want their. It's all a fee. They they give us three thousand dollars, and we'll. There's a special edition. It's, I think there's an Orange County publication that does Orange Coast Orange Coast Weekly. So, is it, I mean, we could. The things that come up when the lawyers would pay somebody to market for them. It's just, it's just endless. And that really isn't the purpose of this of of, of this opinion. But I, I'm actually personally becoming 
persuaded by Andrew that we really don't need to conclude. Right, I mean, right. I, I don't know that someone reading this necessarily is going to assume all I have to do is I'm sure exactly I would say here survive. in a different context with a fee-based system and, and my worries are over. I mean, I, it, it, it's, in some ways, I, I'm being persuaded to the notion that maybe we just shouldn't include, try to include a form of this. I agree. But it, does anybody feel strongly that we should? I see head shaking. Okay, so maybe we just we'll, we'll leave that one then, which means that there's just one other um, issue here, which uh, I alluded to earlier, but the new rule seven point one. Sorry. Sorry. So does that mean we don't even leave Joel's original? Footnote, just take it up. Right? I think the whole, yeah. I was trying to fix his footnote. I, I stuffed it badly. <laughs> We're just going to get rid of both. Okay, just making sure. All right. Um, so, so the last issue is that it's the testimonial endorsements under our current rule and the standards. There's a presumption um, that it's, mis you know, just, it's misleading unless you have an appropriate disclaimer. That language has changed in the new 7.1. And so where this comes up is on the red line, page six, we have this heading testimonials and reviews by third parties. And this first paragraph sort of lays it out and is talking about standard two. And so I think one of the proposals to fix this would be to drop a footnote. One second, let me. You want to pull up from seven point one game? Uh, well, yeah. Or from plus, seven. plus the red line. Yeah. There's a handout of seven point one. Yeah, it's over there. If anybody wants just to just look it. at it, you know. but I can copy and paste whatever we're gonna add. Um, so right there, I mean, we could drop a footnote, and, and the notion would be to basically say that you know the California Supreme Court recently approved, let's just get this out there, we can tinker with it, but recently approved a new advertising rule 7.1, which will become effective November 1, 2018. That rule does not include, maybe include isn't the right word, but let, I just get it out and we can tinker with it, does not include a rebuttable presumption that testimonials or endorsements are deceptive or misleading absent an express disclaimer, period. Instead, it states in comment bracket three, close bracket, and then quote the language from the comment which is, uh, what is it? Find it here. Communication that truthfully reports a lawyer's possibly yes, achievements on behalf of clients or former clients, comma, or a testimonial about 
or endorsement of the lawyer, comma. Oh, you got to have it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How much of it do you want? Do you want the entire sentence? Between you, should it start at testimonial? Yes, I, it's over inclusive. I quoted the first part. So, um, no, no, you need you need to start the sentence to make it make sense. I think you can put an ellipsis after um, to take out a, lawyer. achieve, a lawyer's achievements on behalf of a right. client or client. Reports. Well, is attempt communication the truth from reports? Uh, and testament. Uh, Isn't it just a, is a communication? Dot, dot, dot. I think it's just a testimonial about the endorsement of the lawyer. Maybe it's the All right. So, take all this out. really what we're getting at. They're, they're, they're not saying it's presumptive. They're just saying it now often avoids the result of, you know, being misleading or something. So you might want to just use it on the last sentence. Uh, can you just say C 7.1 comment 4? I mean, we don't. Couldn't you say it, it doesn't include a rebuttable presumption of endorsements, blah, blah, blah. The rule instead says an inappropriate disclaimer or qualifying language often avoids creating, you know, a, a, a violation. I mean, that's, that's the essence like of what that. we're saying, right? Like, that's the yeah. so like that. In the logical, I only want to maybe spell out the logic of the thing. Going forward, it's going to be violations of 7.1 that are going to require that. Yeah. You know, not not the presumptive violations. So we're just saying from here on out, it will be violations of 7.1, not, and that's not presumptive. I, I think the essence of this particular thing was to just make clear that there are no longer presumptive, the lack of a disclaimer or the inclusion of, dis, of the disclaimer will, will you know, the absence of a disclaimer will not be a, 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 a presumptive violation. Instead, they're saying disclaimers are helpful, basically. It's, it's, you don't have to use it in order to avoid violating the rule. However, they're helpful. I think that's the essence of what is different with respect to disclaimers, if that makes sense. So, what would you say Again, so I'm not sure why are you want to so include a rebuttal presumption that testimony is not presumptive or misleading absent. Uh, instead, comment four states that dis, uh, an appropriate disclaimer or qualifying language quote often avoids end quote um, uh, 
a violation of the rules. It's, it actually says avoids creating unjustified expectations. So, well, however, we want to power that. But 7.1 does check that. Avoids to create the bundle being misleading. What? 7.1b is going to, there's going to be presumptions. No, it maintains the ability for the state bar to adopt standards yeah. that have not So, we adopted. presume they will do that. Yeah. I mean, isn't it reasonable to assume they'll follow through with that? Yes, I but it, I don't think important. it's reasonable. I don't necessarily think that they're going to say something that's contrary to this comment and say we're here just as, you know, disclaimers can often avoid, you know, misleading the consumer and then have that kind of language and then create a presumption because that would make it very difficult for lawyers to know what they're supposed to do. They read one thing and they think, yeah. oh, okay, I can use a disclaimer, but I don't have to, and then in another place say that it's, you know, you have to. But we're, but I'm just, I'm just saying, if, if, can I just be clear? If, if there's a violation of the new 7.1, right, it would trigger a duty to disclaim, right, just like the duty we're describing here. So, you know, if, if, if there's a testimonial that is not, that is affirmatively misleading, if you will, rather than presumptively misleading, you still have a duty to disclaim. You now have the duty to disclaim under the new rule, right? I mean, you can't disclaim if it's, I mean, if, if you did not, in fact, get um, Theresa a million dollars, and she says, she, she says that you did in her testimonial, there's no disclaimer that's going to fix that. Right, that, the, the issue, the it's kind of strange thing, the way it works now, is even if your testimonial or whatever is truthful, if it doesn't have the disclaimer, it's presumptively misleading. Because it's misleading for other reasons. You're implying that you're going to get these results every time. And so it's, it's really that. that yeah. Okay. Yeah. The presumption is what's different. The presumption is what's different. So and it just is worth, I think, mentioning because in the ABO opinion, we talk about that presumption. And we should just say, hey, by the way, that presumption's not going to be around anymore. But it's maybe. Well, that's why I don't think they're going. I don't think they're going to go there. Well, well, you don't think they're going to go? Well, I so, so this language is not an actual. Why would they include it? This is the rest of that sentence. What do you want me to take out of it? I know it's clunky, but what about the prior approach we had, where we just quoted it directly? And just As opposed to summarizing, yeah. it's new, yeah. it's a way to highlight this. We don't have to. I would just say that an appropriate disclaimer, just and quote the last sentence, which is the thing that's about disclaimers. The last sentence of, of the comment. An appropriate disclaimer? Yes. No, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't quote all the stuff in there that's not relevant to the point. Which is just about the speakers. Well, I'm not sure. Yeah. That's correct. I don't think there's a gap. I mean, like the second sentence and then put dot 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 and I jump to the last sentence. So you guys can decide which sentence you want to keep. If not both. I mean you could just say the presumptions on the uh, although it may be a top to the leader. That's why I'm that the original thought was to say the presumption's not there, here's what it says right. as to this issue. Right, and what it says as to the issue is that an appropriate disclaimer will call down. No, but it says that's not before it. I think if all you say is an appropriate disclaimer, it makes up the voice creating unjustified 
I think you give them what's there about it. What it now says is that there is no presumption that's true, but, but a testimonial doubt or endorsement could be misleading if it's you know, presented in a, this such and such a way, and an appropriate disclaimer or qualifying language may help avoid that result. So I, I think it's all, I think all of that is relevant. I think if you take the first part out, you're, you're not actually completing the, the thought. I, I, think it's fine. I, mean, I don't think it definitely is. I think it's stronger with, with what you're proposing. So are people okay with that as the fix? We're leaving it like this? Well, let's leave it for a second. Okay. Let's see if people agree with it. So we can become effective. In the first line. Yeah, right. right. And November is misspelled. I mean, I realize you didn't have to put your language away. It is what it is. Trying to fix it. This is probably an obvious question. It's weird the comments. Right. Things like that. This is the first reference to a presumption in the well, is it? In the, well, no, actually, in the digest, we talk about standard two. But I thought it made more sense to put it here where we're, we're substantively discussing the issue. Unless you think we need to put it in the digest for the first time we talk about standard two. It's the third paragraph, it's the second paragraph of the digest. Third party testimonials are posted on the profile. This is making me think that we should just pull this opinion, hold on to it till November, and then and just, and just take out that part when kind of there's no longer a presumption. But oh, yeah, just change it to say, right, we don't have to talk about standard two because there won't be any more standard two. But maybe I'm. Maybe, I don't know. That we, we, it's probably a bad idea. Yeah. I think it's a good idea. Yeah. Keep it. To, to fix it, how, I mean, the rules have been approved. Yeah. So we're in what I call purgatory between now and November 2nd. We're in between. I think so. So, you know, what value is this going to help? I got sent to the board. It's not going to be published until August at best. So, how we should look, you know, how best will this help lawyers going forward? And maybe, are those the, not the buckets you described when we started our meeting way back at 10 o'clock? You don't need this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is that your way of saying that 3 o'clock break is coming? No, no. <laughs> no uh, Give me a hint. It won't go back up above coffee. Not these current edits, but maybe. Uh, well, that's I think that's a good idea. At least on the, because do the AVO. The, the advertising yeah. rules are structured so differently. Yeah. Even, though, even though the analysis is going to be the same, it's it's such a seed change as a, compared to other rules that might not be as markedly different. I think it makes sense to change it. I don't necessarily think we have to wait until November. So I, I think we could change it and then maybe just drop the footnote, you know, this rule will become effective November, whatever. And then by the time it gets published, it'll be past November, whatever. Um, and then we don't delay, but we make it more relevant. So maybe the next time around. I, I think because that presumption is woven throughout this opinion. So the other issue with that approach is this opinion is taken to suffer from neglect and looking at the new rules is going to take a serious study issue between now and the next, next meeting. Is there anyone that's willing to volunteer and put themselves out there for doing that detailed review? And if you want to take a break. <laughs> uh, but I, I do think this, this both the assignment and the status of opinion, if anyone's willing uh, to take 
the charge of if it's uh, just that issue. Just standard two. Yeah, if it's just that presumption. But all, all one four hundreds, we're going to change to seven point ones. Yeah, but but actually. But I, I think the analysis is the same. I largely agree with you. you can't. But here's a false, deceptive, and misleading. It's just going to be uh, deceptive comes out, so false and misleading. I mean, we really got to do a close reading of the opinion to make sure that's that's all. That's the time. It's not you're not creating things out of whole cloth. It's you know, did you ever want to be a New York Times or Washington Post editor? Here's your chance. Yeah, look close. Check your sources. So, I see you trying to get really small. I know. I said, you know, you have two more meetings before you get your office. I know. That's what I'm worried about. But I'm, you know, I also know I do a lot of stuff. I do a lot of presentations on advertising and stuff. So it's like I kind of know. But I'd still rather lose anyone else. Ah, where'd you go? Joel. He's trying to make himself for this. This is Joel. Oh, oh, yeah. No, I'll, I'll take a shot at it. I, I'm working on an article on the same uh, article for you know, for um, uh, July on the same issue. So I've already had to take a deep dive, and I've got to harmonize an article because it's going to come out before oh, the opinion does. Awesome. So they've got to, so they've got to talk to each other anyway. Right. Perfect. Well, so we're all in agreement that. We're going to go back and do this and be very thankfully you will. have someone who volunteers us. All right. So that that was really it. I mean, there's a couple of other, you know, modifications. Like I said, Joel incorporated the, the minor edits, but the, those are the only subsequent things. The other modifications were in red lines, so we, we would have been able to pick those up in, in the studio. All right, so I think we're done with that one. So, Teresa. I send this copy to Teresa. Um, also, before we forget, anybody on a local bar association know if your local bar association will also be commenting on 1.2.1? Anybody know? Just curious. Uh, uh, OCPA. They might. Okay. San Diego's considering Okay. I'm oh, just curious. Okay. Um, I, maybe we should. Uh, let's do. How about. Um, it was something easy. There's plenty of these. Eric, how about um, colleague impairment? Does it hurt that one? All right, well, I have to commend uh, Brad, who was uh, so kind as to offer comments and offer uh, the inclusion of references to the new rules. We haven't discussed this opinion for two minutes. It's been two minutes now. Not three. three. D. Sorry, D. D. Sorry? So the facts uh, are largely unchanged uh, from the four prior iterations of this. The goal was, in addition to incorporating references to the rules, to streamline the analysis. Um, and again, Kendra takes, uh, or should get, the credit for revamping this. I made some changes after receiving uh, her suggestions, but uh, for the most part, we maintain the, the themes. As I said, the facts are largely the same. Uh, the analysis of the restaffing and, and scope of um, what duties may apply, the, the practical aspect. That's been substantially revised. And uh, we have unfortunately not had an opportunity to meet as a subcommittee to discuss uh, Kendra's uh, work and my revision. So I don't know if uh, the other members of the drafting committee have any thoughts. 
that if they'd like to offer. Okay. Well, I'm, your I'm on that. I have a couple comments that I'll give you, and then um, we can open it up to others. Um, so one comment in the digest, um, the first paragraph, we, we have this statement. We say an attorney who knows or reasonably suspects a colleague is impaired has an ethical responsibility to take reasonable steps to investigate the matter and to protect any clients uh, whose representation may be negatively affected by, and then we say, preventing such an impairment from causing breaches of, of duties owed to the firm's clients before harm occurs. And I just sort of struck me with this question, I'll just throw it out there, but the, the beginning of that is saying we have to take reasonable steps to investigate and to protect the client. Um, yeah. Uncontroversial, but the, the back end of it starts to sound a little sort of like strict liability uh, in the sense that I, I, I just sitting there wondering to myself, could a, could a lawyer, a law firm take reasonable steps and yet there still be some kind of negative effect because of the timing of when they found out or what have you. And so I just had a note to myself, would we want to maybe qualify this a little bit? It's really the back part, because the beginning is saying reasonable. It's not saying you're guaranteeing right. you're absolutely preventing. Um, you know, say something like affected, uh, uh, affected by, uh, uh, whose representation may be negatively affected by seeking to prevent such an impairment. I, I don't know, just that, that last part of the sentence seems almost like strict, you know, you so gotta, you got to take reasonable steps, but then saying sort of to absolutely protect or, or prohibit uh, uh, any kind of uh, uh, breach of duty. I, I don't know. Anyway, yeah, the point is just, is should the back end of that sentence be qualified a little bit? I think that if it were, it's consistent with the principle, which is reasonable steps. But I mean, I do think, it seems to me there are scenarios where lawyers could from an ethical standpoint, take reasonable steps, you know, based on when they know and so forth. And it doesn't necessarily mean that there couldn't have been some kind of an impairment or that an impaired lawyer might somehow, you know, go off the ranch and be able to do something that is, you know, technically, you know, not beneficial to their case. Maybe they can clean that up more, et cetera. But anyway, that, that was just one comment was, should there be a little bit of a, a qualifier there? The other comment I had just in the digest, and this is on page two of the red line, and on page, or line 54, and this is kind of, this is a question, I guess, in part, but um, the point that's being made is that if a colleague, we, we say starting on 51, if a colleague's impairment does not significantly or immediately affect any current client representations, then the impaired attorney may be able to seek treatment for other, for or otherwise, treatment for or otherwise address the causes of his or her impairment before needing to alert the client. And the language, the, the word that's sticking with me is before, and I guess my question is, is the intent of this to say there may be certain circumstances where, um, you know, if, if the impairment is not going to significantly or immediately affect, then we're saying the impaired attorney can seek treatment and there doesn't need to be a disclosure? Or is it, the before makes it sound like ultimately there's still going to be a disclosure. Oh. You might be able to go do this before you have to disclose, but it seemed like the point that was being made is there may be some situations and some types of impairment where you wouldn't need to make the disclosure. You know, so, we're pulling this person off. He hasn't affected the case. This is something that can be treatable, et cetera, et cetera. A anyway, so the before was throwing me there. So just without needing to alert. Yeah. So I mean, I, if it's if it's correct. Need to. Um, yeah. W without needing to alert the client is why I put question mark. If that if that's the concept. You know, yeah. uh, on that sentence, just because I had a question on that one as well. The standard of significantly or immediately affect, it sounded like a standard we're sort of articulating for the first time. Um, 
and, and I wonder the source of that. Is that really the standard, or is it material? I, I, it feels like it's more like materiality. Like if your impairment will materially affects. I, that to me, it seems more standard. It seems you know more based in um, some of the the communication duty to communicate cases, rather than this. Impact, you know, seriously, significantly, or immediately affect. I, I don't know. I, I was a little uncomfortable with that sort of articulating a new standard and interjecting like a temporal. Uh, how how quickly will this hurt? You? It may be more accurate because if you had a serious, if you had an impairment that is going to, it's not going to happen immediately, but it's really going to impair the case downstream. Right. I don't think we're saying you can. Right. It seems like it's more of a material, but I know this might be something it's that It's material you guys risk, about, isn't it? It feels it's like a, it should it's be. It's material risk of impact is, is what the client's entitled to know about, something like that. Either a material risk or have a material effect. Yeah, I don't I know. Mean, a, yeah, that yeah. has to be significant, you know, significant or immediate. It, I, I would think it, if it's going to materially affect the client, you, you have to do something. Well, non trivial. I interrupted you. No, that's right. To say something. Uh, no I, I think the point is well taken. I mean, one of the issues we've struggled with, or at least in my time with this uh, opinion, is wanting to provide some uh, measure of discrete guidance or standard and not finding clear guidance in that regard. So there's, there's, I know there has been some effort to construct such a standard from the materials that we've cited, but again, not with any clear uh, ability to do so. Well, didn't you guys cite a case, or was it in another, um, for opinion about what is a significant development under the terms of the rule, and then it talks about, I thought, materiality. Yes, I, I, I do recall that. Yeah, whatever that authority is, seems like that's what the standard should be, to, to me. I think the only reason the temporal thing comes up here is because they're saying, you know, if you can get it fixed before it's going right. to impact, right. and that's fine, but I mean, the, so, but that's, I guess it's just the concepts are sort of pushed together at this point. Mm -hmm. Right. It, Right, because if it's not going to be immediate, it's probably not material. Mm -hmm. Well, it, 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 if it can, so it, it won't be material if it can be fixed before it. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, because it's in I the think, next sentence as well. What if we just say, um, if the impaired attorney is able to see before any material, if the, if the impairment is curable before any material impact. I don't know about the word curable, right. but, well, yeah. but I know where you're going with that. That could, yeah. that could work. Yeah, I mean, there, is a, ton, there is a time frame here that we have to express. Immediately might not be the right word, but somehow we have to get it across. That it's can you get this treatment or help or whatever it is before, which is not a good word, <laughs> um, you know, it, it affects the cases or the representation. So if you don't have enough time to do that, then it might not be an option. And significantly comes from significant developments. So, so maybe that's the thing to look at, is what is a significant development, and I think I think, that, I think it's materiality. I can't remember the case over there. Well, the Neil case is one. Yeah, yeah. Montana, Montana, yeah, yeah. Montana. Uh, it's one of those cases. That's the fiduciary duty side of it. But with this has come up both in, um, uh, in 1204, oh, in the various opinion. Uh, and in, uh, it's, it's very much in, in Richard's opinion, right? Your, your lost laptop opinion are both discussing significant development. And, uh, and so 
kind of hitching, hitching the lot. If logic of this coming into those opinions would make some sense. That's a good, good direction to go and look at. Um, so just a, a couple of additional comments. Um, over on page three, the red line, so this is starting the discussion section. On page three, and then going on page three, we have kind of this introductory uh, paragraph, um, and then we really go into these sort of subheadings. If we go on to page four, we have duty of competence and diligence, and below that, responsibilities of other lawyers in the firm. Um, I just it seemed to me after this opening paragraph under discussion. This is just stylistic, but it might be worth having some kind of sentence or you know, something like the following are ethical issues that are implicated in an impaired lawyer scenario. I mean, that's kind of what we're doing, it's just guiding the reader. I mean, we're going to give you kind of a laundry list now of the ethical issues, and then later on we apply them to the to the factual scenario. But it just seemed to me some kind of sentence there that just a lead in sentence. What's that? A lead in sentence. Yeah, yeah. some kind of lead in that. Now what we're doing is we're issue spotting the, the, the ethics issues that are implicated. And then after that we get into applying it to the specific factors. Um, over on page six, at, at line 226, we have we start this paragraph and we say, as all attorneys in a firm, as as all attorneys in a firm owe duties to all clients of the firm. The impairment of one member may impose additional duties on all attorney members of the firm, not just the attorney members working on a particular client matter. I, I just have a note here. Would it be better to say attorneys than member? I mean, I think some people equate member with like a partner. Um, and it's, I know it's in our old rules that it meant attorney and it, it's being replaced, but because we make the point in the opinion that, you know, it can be lower level people that have the obligation or some of the obligation here because they're working directly on the case or what have you. I just, I would change member. I would just stay away from it. I just think to some people it connotates partner and, and what the obligations we're talking about are not necessarily that's just kind of a big picture. It shows up some different places in the agenda. Right? Yeah. It could be more associates as well. I think it's just following the old Sorry. rules. How the term is defined. Well, oh, maybe I'm being too picky. I just think I think sometimes people read member and they think that that means someone who's like on a certain level. I mean, I, I understand it probably was just pulled out of the bill of rules, but yeah. Yeah. I'd be inclined. I mean, we start by talking about all attorneys in the firm. The impairment, and what we're really saying is impairment of one attorney may impose additional duties on all the other attorney. You know, it says on all attorney members of the firm. Duties on all attorney members. That, that's like, what, what is an attorney member versus an attorney? Well, I, I agree with the, Andrew because, it, because of the, you know, would it have, somebody could read it, try to read out of counsel or a contract attorney who works with that firm. If, if what indeed we're trying, trying to say is that all attorneys that regularly, that regularly interact with this firm and they're acquainted with this have, are going to have some ethical obligations. Well, that's what we're trying to say. I think Andrew's making a very good point. Well, I think, I, mean, I think we need to clarify in terms of, when, and it is qualified to some degree when we say uh, may impose as opposed to does impose, but. Uh, you know, obviously, attorneys in a large firm that have no knowledge of circumstances affecting one lawyer in a distant office, um, and that results in a rather ambiguous statement in terms of what the duty may be. Uh, so, rather than uh, rather than leave it as it is, perhaps say may impose additional duties on. And, and we cover this elsewhere on attorneys uh, who know or reasonably should know of the circumstances giving rise to the impairment or affecting the client representation or, or you know, again, limit it to those who might reasonably be expected to have knowledge of yeah. the circumstance. It's clearly what you need. Yeah, I mean, it just, as it's, 
Well, you're, I'm not disagreeing with you. You're getting more substance. Of, my comment was just using the word member. I would steer clear of because some people that may connotate a lawyer of a particular stature within the firm in terms of whether they're a partner or you know, have equity in the firm, which is not what the analysis is about. So I mean, I'm not disagreeing with you, I, but my point was more basic than just I would steer Understood. clear of saying member. Um, in that same paragraph towards the end of that, we have this sentence at the end that says attorneys may also owe a duty to identify and audit other files of the impaired lawyer to ensure the firm's representation with respect to other matters. Uh, there's some kind of missing word, but um, other matters complies with to ensure that the firm to ensure yeah. okay well it, it, my, my question here was just what I mean I guess it's saying may which is not definitive but you know I wondered if we wanted to say attorneys may also owe a duty in some circumstances I mean I'm not sure where the line is you know where we've got to go back and audit files versus situation where you wouldn't need to do that or to what degree. Um, but it seems like we're saying it wouldn't always be the case. And I, wonder no. if might, I don't know. Go ahead. I almost think it, it is always the case okay. that you have to go. So maybe you should say must. Well, um, then, then we need to maybe. I mean, you might go back and find that there's no problem. Great. We can check that off our list. But I think you have to look at it. So I think maybe we should change the name to must. Well, don't you have to have some reason to think that a little bit of case is going to fail? I think if, 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 I mean, if, if there's a... I don't think you can assume they haven't been. I think you actually have to look and make sure that they weren't. Yeah. I would agree. But Any kind of impairment, though. Let's say we, back to our earlier discussion, we have an impairment that we think on a timeline, you know, we, we don't think it's reached the level we're going to, this person's going to try and get help and we're going to put them in an environment where they're not going to be able to harm the case moving forward. Right, That's well, I, it doesn't say all files. I think you have to use your judgment as to which client matters might have fallen into whatever time frame you believe the impairment affected. Okay. Well, I mean, I guess that's part of, I mean, we're going the other way, but I, I'm raising the issue. We should talk about that because that, yeah. well, that, that did stand out to me. I mean, that's a pretty significant statement. It was qualified. If you make it a must, then it's even more significant. What, what I mean, I think if, if, you, if you just break it down and look at an attorney under these facts where you know this impairment is affecting this particular matter, why would it not potentially affect other matters? And you have to at least look and make sure that it hasn't. And you may conclude that it hasn't, and then you're done, you know, that part of the task. But I think it's irresponsible to not look into it. And sure, you might not have to go back, you know, years, but you should certainly designate a time period in which you need to look. So it sounds like we're saying, though, I mean, between this may and must, that you, have, you must consider whether certain files have to be audited. But that doesn't mean that you actually must go and do the audit for every single file. Well, no, if you don't, this, what you just said uh, every is, single. is, is you, have, you have to think through whether, there, whether there's a risk. If you, if you say, OK, um, you know, I, I thought it through, and um, there was another partner, you know, working closely on all the other matters. So there's the risk. You know, I don't have, think there's a reasonable risk. Then I think probably don't have to actually prove the matters or whatever. So I think that was what you. That's were what I'm saying. That the, yes. the must, to the extent there's a must, is considering whether or not it has to happen. Not actually pursuing the audit if you determine that it's not necessary for whatever reason. Yeah. 
question. So could we say as a compromise, attorneys within the firm must determine if other files of the impaired lawyer have been affected by the impairment? Negatively affected? Negatively affected. I, I think it's must consider, not must determine. Must what? Must consider. Whether. But don't, I mean, is part of the consideration though, doesn't that require you to determine if in fact there has been a uh, material impact on file? I mean, I, if I'm taking the, the comments, you know, from I, what, what I think what Amy was saying is that if, if you consider it and you say, oh, there was another partner, it's very unlikely well, then you that determine. that happened. I don't think you've determined because it could have happened. The only way you can really determine is if you go and look at, at the file and make sure there's no mistake. You know, you can re, you can decide, ah, I probably don't need to audit that file because X, Y, or Z. There was somebody there, it's a closed matter, it doesn't matter, you know, whatever. But I, 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 I do tend more toward what, you know, Kendra's instinct is on this, that it, if you know that this guy has, or a woman has a problem here, that's knowledge that your other clients can benefit from in their matters, and you should go look and see, make sure that a mistake hasn't been made. But you know, I don't think we, we have to necessarily say you must audit it, but it sounds like you must consider is, is where. I like to determine better, too. I mean, consider just kind of means think about it, and I feel like determine, even if there was another partner in the case, maybe you're you're taking an action to speak to that partner to make the determination that it does not need, you don't need to go through the full audit. And also incorporates yeah. your concept of judgment that you mentioned right. earlier, that you're, exer you're right. exercising. You're it's not just, just, it's not just an exercising. abstract thought. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm fine with determining. I, I was getting the sense that others thought that you didn't have to actually audit everyone. We'll see. But this is somewhere in between. Steve's got a kind of pot. I hope this is. Um, I hope this is uh, helpful. I'm, I'm concerned that it won't be. So let me uh, <laughs> let me let me put it out there. The first time, okay? Yeah, it wouldn't be the first time I screwed up. So, um, I have like the client. Is I I, I want to say question. first, I really appreciate what um, Eric and Kendra have done in in bringing in. A bunch of law that we haven't, that we sort of knew existed but weren't able to talk about before. Now we can talk about it. It's enormously helpful. And I also feel very keenly um, the value of Kendra's deep knowledge and understanding of uh, this set of issues from her own practice. What, what is getting me about this opinion is we're, we're down in the weeds talking about. Um, something like, do we have to audit the files? And I can't tell what the operative principles are and whose set of principles we're talking about. Like I have a, I have a, a kind of set of issues. There's, there are issues for, for uh, people who are running firms. There are issues for people who are supervising lawyers. There are issues for people who are working as lower down people. And then there are issues for people who are kind of off to the side, right? Um, and not involved at all, right? And it seems to me that the standards might be different for all those people in terms of A, when do they have an obligation to investigate something, right? Or, uh, to, or to raise a question, right? That'd be one question. The second question would be when do they have an obligation to do something to talk to the person? And the answer might be different for each of those kinds of people, right? And then C, uh, when do they have an obligation to tell the client, right? And it feels like we, we don't have a very, and then what other, D, what other kind of corrective auditing type issues might there be? And, and these issues kind of arise like, I don't think that the junior lawyer ever has an auditing issue, right, in the sense of, of actually conducting the audit. That seems like a crazy, unreasonable thing to ask uh, 
but I, at least at least I want to understand what the principle is that pulls them. If they do, I want to understand what it is. So I feel like until we understand clearly what the principles are, it's really hard to get down in the weeds and start to talk about this specific language. And I don't understand fully what the principles are of reading this. So my short answer to that is right before this, I put in the new rules 5.1 um, yeah. and 5.2. And admittedly, I wasn't necessarily analyzing them much. Yeah. I was just kind of putting them in there so that we could discuss how much of that we needed to include. Um, but if you look at 5.2, it lays out that you, know, you tell a supervisory lawyer but then if you feel like action is not being taken or that the rules are still going to be violated, you then have a, this independent obligation. To, oh, I understand. Yeah. No, I get that. So I, I think there could be situations where a subordinate lawyer might have to do an audit. I agree. As yeah. well. well, I you know, that's an interesting it's an interesting question. But it's a pretty that would be a really I, I understand. What I'm saying is I don't think the principles are laid out in enough detail right now. I agree yeah. you've got the rules in there, right. but I can't tell what they, you know, how, what they, this way of putting them is, uh, is I, I'd like to see it more clearly laid out in a sense. Okay. You know, what, the, what we think the actual sort of, not, not just what the black letter rules say, but some something that's discursive and analytic that says, here's what we actually think the rules are for supervisors, here's what we think they are for for firm runners, here's what we think they are for junior people, here's what we think they are for people who are off to the side. Something like that. Because we, we're we're purporting to talk about all these different kinds of people and yet we haven't stated what we think exactly the rules are for each of them. Yeah. And, uh, uh, on that point, I, I think I, I totally agree, um, and and I think we've talked about this before as an organizational thing, and it's probably gone back and forth and back and forth because that's often what happens. But it did occur to me that it's feeling well, and that sometimes by by the time you you get to the discussion of the, the nuts and bolts, like how does it apply here, you, I'm forgetting a little bit. Oh wait. We, or didn't we just talk about this? And I wonder if maybe if you bring the analysis of the application of each of these principles to the facts here, yeah. you know, in one section, it might also help with that analysis because you're, you're stating the rule, you're analyzing it, and then you're immediately applying it, which will also help to elucidate you know, what we think the rules are and how they apply. And so it may serve both functions it may end up shortening, shortening it up a little bit because you don't have to repeat you know when you discuss below some of the principles you've already talked about and it may also inform the analysis um, so I'm a little a more agnostic about that because I think the opinions that I've read that work the best are the ones that concisely state the little rules that you're applying and then apply them in a separate section but but it I don't know that it matters I'm not, I'm not clear to you whether, but I do think it, right now we're kind of straddling it because there's some substantive discussion up top in the what could be called the legal analysis section, and there's some at the back. And yeah, they, I agree. Yeah, right. Could be cleaned up. Right. Um, so talking about thinking about the organization, so what, I mean, one issue that seems to be sort of percolating around is. What Steve is, is suggesting is that he's maybe making a change to this opinion started out about what are the obligations of a junior person right. when faced with a new pair of lawyer. Right? In a small firm. In a small right. firm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but it just changed. This is more. I'm sure. So, uh, so it, and if we want to stick with that, then I'm not sure that, Steve, your concern is, is They can also carve away a lot of stuff and not discuss it at all. Right. But on the other hand, yeah, so there's that point. And then the other point is I, I feel like we've now created 
really can't have both two types of lawyers and two scenarios. So I'm always going, it's like a I'm like four, there's a grid, and I'm like, okay, my junior partner, big firm, you know, it, it, it's, to me it's just, I, and I know there's very good reason for, for each of those alternatives. My instinct is we want one impaired lawyer. We don't need two impaired lawyers. I don't think equity partners use that much. Mm -hmm. I know the work it's doing. It's doing like, you could be impaired, but if you're really not doing anything wrong, um, that's not, you know, that's a different analysis. But I don't feel like that's, that's not really that, you know, we can all kind of get that, you know. So I feel like if we had one impaired lawyer, I like the big firm, small firm. I think that's very important. So just throw that out there. Uh, you know, I, you put your finger on what I thought this might suffer from. I, I was going to comment that it's 10 and a half pages long. Well, some of that is that I just pasted it. So uh, you know, I, I share that. <laughs> that I, I know exactly yeah. what you're talking about when you inherit a, an opinion. So that's, but I just think we need to think about some of these opinions that are of that length, um, have some sentences that I identify that are longer than 50 words. Um, and maybe one way to cure that is to cut back on the scenarios. I think it's. I think it's not. It would be far more friendly to readers if they don't have to sit there. You know, I, I now need. I need a diagram. I need to diagram the hypothetical and remember who all the actors are. Right. People will learn more if they can. If they don't have to pay attention to it for so long. So, in, in the spirit of those two comments, if. I, I, it, the uh, the partner who's going through the, the person who's going through a really hard time around the divorce, or the person who we've identified as impaired, right, is a is a good figure, and we could do that figure in a in a large firm and in a small firm, right, and we could have the situation be one where there's just a junior associate, right, and then a situation where there is a junior associate, right. And a managing partner, or a committee, or something like that, and that that frame, kind of that frame, uh, provides, I think, the opportunity for you guys to do the things you, you want to do with duties of supervision and so forth and so on in a way that is uh, pretty it, it kind of simplifies things, clarifies things. I don't think getting. I think getting rid of that partner is not. Right. I, I, I sense, and this predates my involvement, but I, I sense it was that that particular impaired lawyer scenario was chosen because it seemed topical and uh, relatable from the standpoint of aging lawyers, baby boomers in particular, um, and that seemed to resonate. But I agree. I don't know that... I, Essentially, the nature of the impairment is largely material. It's just that the lawyer is impaired, and let's have one impaired lawyer, but analyze the uh, duties under the two firm scenarios, and that should help in terms of not just uh, shortening the facts, but the analysis to some degree. Okay. But, but, but does this group still think that we want the focus to be
information out there for young attorneys to understand you know, what what they can, should, or must do in a situation where you know, someone more senior to them is, is struggling and, and needs, needs help. But I think we also have to keep in mind the stuff about when that junior person goes to the firm, what the firm's obligations are to you. Yeah. 100% agree with that. So. I think this, I, this is good. I, I think it should be the impaired baby boomer opinion. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because everybody's thinking about it. <laughs> And, uh, and, and I think from the perspective of a younger lawyer or a, or a subordinate, it would be a very topic. So try to keep it on one track. I think that might make it shorter. To I had a, a narrow, practical comment. But before I say it, I want to applaud the committee for doing this opinion. We know that the occurrence for this kind of problem is a very significant problem high stress occupation like yours so persevere bravo to you keep up the good work so my very narrow comment on red lines 57 and 58 in part it reads if the impairment significantly impacts the representation the client must be notified of this significant development and I was identifying with reader like what did that mean does that mean I the attorney in the firm am supposed to tell the client that their attorney just entered alcohol rehab or had a psychiatric emergency I know you, you I don't think you mean that because the next sentence reads caution must be taken to avoid violating the impaired lawyers privacy so I didn't know if you wanted to just leave those two sentences next to each other or whether it would be a little more helpful to just give the example in the opinion that you're saying that you're giving the suggestion as to what the either the baby boomer <laughs> attorney or whoever the attorney in question is like what they might say you know but so I don't know you know offline I could chat with you and Ken right now and try to find the language for that. But I presume you mean you, you, you're not going to be telling the client the specific reason for the apparent. Right. 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 Now, okay. Actually, that was the subject of much discussion. Yeah. Last yeah. Time. And, and I had one final comment and since it dovetails to some extent with Steve's comment, I'll just throw it out there. Just, just conceptually moving forward. There are a couple places, I mean, we do you know, as we get further through the opinion, it makes the point about privacy, and it makes the point that it, I think it's saying basically, you, you know, you have to advise about the significant development, but that doesn't mean you're giving all the nitty gritty details about the impairment. And, and I wonder, um, for example, Like on page seven of the red line, it's uh, line 259, this paragraph starts, the client must be informed of the substantial impairment of an attorney working on the matter, et cetera, et cetera. And I wondered if, I want to decide this today, but it, it, it's really, it seems to me what we're saying, at least in places within the opinion, and keeping in mind that eventually we, we get specifically to this point of if you don't tell them everything, well, it seems like what we're really saying, it, it's the fact of impairment. Yeah. Maybe that's not the way to put it, but I mean, sometimes we, we, we have to do something, because in some of these places where it says, like a client must be informed of a substantial impairment, someone's gonna read that and interpret it like Steve's saying. What is that, they, 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 it's not gonna be clear. Does that mean you're saying this is the, you know, this person has an alcohol problem, they've had it for X period of time, and blah, 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 they're in, you know, rehab, et cetera. I mean, it seems like, I don't know if it's the fact and effect or what have you, but as we go through this opinion, that issue that Steve has highlighted shows up in a bunch of places, and we need to sort of figure out how we're gonna say early on, we're gonna signal to people that, you know, we're not saying that you know all the nitty gritty details come out, and I don't know if saying the fact of impairment is the right way to do it. But it, 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 and tell me if I'm wrong. But in the idea, kind of, I mean, 
if, if they're impaired in a way that it's, there's going to be a significant development, we have to basically tell them the impact of that on their case. You know, if someone new is coming on the case, I mean, so the effect of the impairment seems like it's something we're saying has to be disclosed, the, the, or the impact of the impairment, or the consequence with respect to the handling of the representation. But um, we have to figure out what that first portion is, because we say, a lot of times we say, you have to tell them about the impairment. And I just think until you get to the eighth or ninth page or whatever, the person who's reading it, it reads it just like Steve, at least some people, and they're going to say, they're not going to know what that means. And then at the end, it's really like important. this huge qualification. You can't really tell them anything about the details. You're just, you know. So we got to find some way to. Yeah, yeah. Like the fact that they're no longer going to be able to continue working on the matter and what the impact of their departures had on You know, some maybe some specific concrete yeah. concepts about. It's just something to think about. But we got to find some way to articulate early on and consistently what it is we're saying has to be communicated. And it's, it's not the impairment because we know at the end of the day we're saying well, the details of that. Yeah, you have to communicate that a change is going to be made. The question right. is, do they have a, do you always have to say why the change is being made? And I don't think life works that way. I don't think life always has to work that way. I don't think you're ethically required to say why a change is being made. My, they, my, they, because of privacy concerns. Well, it's, uh, it, so it, some, it, it, it really depends upon the circumstances. It does. And what makes me uncomfortable is that we state it as a bright line. Yeah, I And never, you know, you never say it. That's what we're right. saying. And I don't think that that, I don't, I'm very uncomfortable with the bright line nature of, and it appears really on page 11, which is truly in the opinion, where we say, you know, disclosing the existence of the impairment and the impact it will have on the representation is the only information that an attorney is ethically required to communicate to the client. Sometimes that might be true. Sometimes I think it isn't. I think it's a, um, it was on um, 429. To, because I think, Matt, it does depend on the circumstances. You're right. I don't think you always have to say. But I also don't think it's true to say you can never say. Now, right. if it's a medical I, I, issue, that's different. I, if it's I, divorce. I would, I'm, I'm not advocating for either absolute. I'm advocating for right. absolute. Exactly. That Me too. So, and I think we should make that that clear that you don't always, but we say here at the end that you don't, you just don't ever. And okay. Don't exactly. Ever. I mean, that's a fair point, and I'm not trying to to definitively answer that question, but that's another good example where we say on 429, and here we use the language existence, disclosing the existence of the impairment. I don't really like that. At the end of the day, however we cut it, whether it's fact specific or what have you. When we talk about a disclosure, we need to find a way to articulate accurately, early on and consistently, what that means. Because otherwise, I think people are going to be in Steve's boat. They're going to read through it and not understand it. That was my only other Any Any other comments on this? Really good job. So wait, yeah, it's great. Go back to your comment. Are you saying that it should say never or shouldn't say? I think it. I don't think it should be on either side. I don't okay. think it should say always, and I don't think it should say never. I think it's, it's very fact dependent. There may be circumstances where you would say more about the impairment. I don't think that's the true. If it's a medical issue, that's completely private. But if it's a divorce or. Yeah, you know, it's well, it is, but it's not the same. I mean, yeah. there are well, different levels. Anyway, I don't definitely don't want to have a privacy discussion. Be something yeah. that, that highlights the fact that you have to be sensitive to the issues of privacy, and that that may impact what you say, but not go quite so far as to say, therefore, you're, you're never ever going to disclose something like that. Right, because at the end of the day, you have to put your client's interests ahead of your own as fiduciaries, and that includes an impaired attorney. In listening to the discussion, are you suggesting, maybe it's Matt, is that we shorten this opinion? Yeah, I think. Yes, a there's a lot of, of <laughs> I, I understand that. There are a lot of rules that are being addressed. So the question I have is, do you think this is an opinion that should be written in two opinions? Yeah, I, there are several opinions here. Because, you know, the, the content of it would be changes you've made are good, but uh, 
you want a shorter opinion, I think you're going to have to take on a whole factual scenario. So what would you recommend is the chunk that could be taken out, do you think? Yeah, I don't have, personally, I don't have a problem with this link, but I'm yeah. just saying, logically, if you're saying you need to shorten it and it's substantively pretty solid with some of the changes you've made, then I think you, you're narrowing your choices. You're going to either have to limit the issues or take a more superficial approach to it. I don't know. I, I don't agree with that. I think there's a lot in here that could be cut. I mean, for example, I mean, there's places where we say, sometimes in federal court you may not be able to get out. But we don't need, need that, but that's not ethics. I mean, and that's just yeah, an example, a, and I don't need to pick on it. But yeah. I, I actually, I mean, I'd be totally happy to provide a markup with some thoughts. But I, first of all, I think when we, when we narrow it down to one impaired lawyer, I think that's going to improve things. I also don't, I do think it needs to be shorter than 10 pages, but once it's tight and there's and there's strong analytical through line, I don't think it's the length. I think it's still feeling scattered because it's still coming together. So. In the, there, in the footnotes, there's a reference to the to ADA rules, and I thought they were really interesting. The one about should you tell, when the lawyer leaves, should you tell the client um, about the impairment? When, when the client's following the lawyer, that's really interesting. And it just, well, this is what the ABA says, and I thought, well, okay, so in California, do I follow the ABA? What do I do with this footnote? And I was wondering whether, you're, that's a really interesting topic, and it is not exactly tangential, well, <laughs> but I, you don't need to address everything. I don't know about Eric, credit. but when you inherit these opinions, <laughs> there is some hesitation right. to just completely rewrite it, because I know that a lot of time and effort went into whatever, so I think, yeah, it's, it's yeah, well, I'm also going to have carte blanche. You're being offered carte blanche. Yeah. Oh, yeah? Yeah. 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 Go for it. Now that we have yeah. permission. <laughs> you can keep us going as long as you're on the committee. Go for it. Okay. So, um, do people want to take a quick break? Sometimes we do that, but I don't know. It's we have some people are leaving early too. You know, yeah, I I gotta leave at four, and you have mine. Maybe we should just power through. Power through. Yes, power through. Um, how about doing yours, Matt? Sure. Who's the page it starts on? Page sixty-three of your materials okay. would be would be the red line. The last time this was just sailing through. So keep that in mind. Are we a soft? Are we a stat? Exactly. Right. Uh, so I'm going to refer to I, I am going to redo this to draft it under the new rules. So I get that part. The changes that you see were for clarity, for transition. Um, and you can see so there's very little red red writing. Uh, and also was the fact that Mimi wasn't at that meeting. I had no, did not have her notes uh, on my own. So, but I do think that, so the only thing I want to call your attention to is page six. Where we talked about this, where there was a See the red lining where you're going to wonder why we deleted the reference to silence as an affirmation and a cite to that formal opinion. We talked about this, it was on the Saturday. But that opinion was a, it's sort of a dissatisfying opinion. It's an old opinion, 1986, that seemed to be uh, at odds with the more modern view of confidentiality, which is you won't utter anything that would ever sabotage your client's case, even when they may deserve to have that uttered. Uh, but in, the, in that opinion, they were talking about something that an attorney would actually say in the presence of the judge that would cue the judge in uh, not, to, not to believe something. 
and it may well be right, but it was something that we decided we didn't need to do. That's 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 what I heard, um, and so I deleted that. That's that's what I understood, and I and I agree with that. And the reason why we deleted the the other case that said the other opinion that's it. Footnote ten is that it just it took it, it wasn't really much of a relevant opinion. Um, because the point the problem with 1986-7 was that it actually had the attorney saying something affirmative in the presence of the judge. And I thought the opinion was a bit dated uh, and may well be questionable. And it was unnecessary for this for where this opinion has had the right. Okay. So um, I guess the, we can open up the subcommittee first. Yeah. I'm sorry, was that? Yeah, yeah, I, I have no other comments. Okay. Um, and Steve and Ifala. I just have a, I mean, overall, I think it's great. I think it should actually go out. But I have a few minor, uh, minor comments. Um, in the uh, list of issues, there are a couple of places where we could insert civil, since we're only focusing on civil. In issue two, between upcoming and trial. Uh, in issue three, in the second line, between testified at civil trial. At the trial? Yes, testify to and add civil there. Um, in the digest, instead of ignore, I would I would say condone. I'm sorry, what, what, what line? Uh, line, line 31. 30, may not, the attorneys may not ignore the introduction of evidence they know to be false. I was kind of wondering about that, you know, I mean, um, Condone is troublesome. You're allowing it, it, it. It gives a lawyer the option of saying, well, I didn't condone it. Yeah. What, what, what line? Uh, line, 30, line, 30, line, 30, line 30, 31. 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, so you may not condone someone who I didn't condone it. I didn't affirm it. I I just didn't do anything. Uh, that's not the, the ethical rule is you can't ignore it. You have to sit and think about it and decide what you should do. You can't you you can't say well I didn't I didn't advocate it. I didn't condone it. So my hands are clean. So I, I why not just say attorneys must carefully balance their duties of confidentiality and say you can just leave out that phrase about ignoring the introduction of evidence and just say what they must do. I'm just, are we in the digest right now? Yeah, yeah. 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 What's, what's, um, no, I think that I think that the critique of the yeah. term ignore I, mi I miss why is there a reason we want to change it? Well the, my only thought was that you that you're uh, looking at it and it, it is a There's a point in which you cannot, um, if, in, if evidence got introduced that was false, you didn't condone it, and it got introduced, and you can't do anything about it, and you can't get relieved from the case, then you're not allowed to rely on it going forward. Um, and so that's a certain way of ignoring it. Um, so that's why I was thinking of maybe it should be that you're not that you're not allowed to condone it, so you're not actually going to rely on it or use it or in any other way uh, make it part of the case that you're putting on. Um, just because there's that one moment where something could happen. You know, um, so do you mean that later on, if, if you have to present the, the case, you couldn't get out, you have to ignore it? Yes. Exactly. 
So yeah. you're not, you know, so that's why it was a little bit of a double edge to use that word here. Um, and so I thought, and, and you know, it's just a wordsmithing thing. You could use some other word. And that's why I thought of, may not condone it, but I see Matt's critique of that word, or may not allow. Endorse. Uh, well, you know, must, or dress, endorse, or, or something else like that. But it's failing action. Yeah. Yeah. This is the strategy. I do too, but I do see that point. Like the leaders, technically, yeah. you have to ignore it. I, I will. If you read, if you read the sentence point. as a whole, it says you can't ignore the introduction of evidence they know to be false. This whole opinion discusses the steps that one must take. Right. And the example that you're addressing, Paul, well, true, is that is the last stop of the station. No, I don't. Um, and I don't think um, my others may disagree. I personally don't interpret that to be ignoring the evidence by failing to rely on it. I've done everything, if you're behaving appropriately, you're doing everything you can to get that out corrected, withdrawing, you can't do it, then um, yes, your last option is to, in the civil setting, um, not, not refer to it. So I don't view ignore as saying like, up, uh, as being more limiting than I think you're implying. I think the entire analysis and the fact that this is just a digest, just simply describing what we're trying to get at. And the next sentence. I don't falls short. Really uh, makes clear what you're talking just about. Just You know, instead, and then says, most carefully balanced. Yeah. No, I'm just saying, it's yeah. just a, a con and, and it's not a really big point. I'm not making a really big point substantively. It was just because of the implication of the way it might play out. I, 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 I'm not wedded to it one way or the other. I'm glad you brought up. I'm, <coughs> I'm not wedded to the word ignore. I, uh, let, me, let me cogitate on it. And sure. I, when sure. I, when I go back and look at it again. Friendly suggestion. Your opinion itself says attorney is required to take action to ensure he doesn't give his or her implicit consent. Is that what you're trying to arrive at? That's on page line 152. Referring to a prior opinion. The idea is not to be promoting or consenting to perpetrating a fraud, right? stage of litigation, attorneys have a duty to present and use only truthful evidence. That's not true. <laughs> they have a duty uh, to zealously represent their client, provided they don't present evidence that they know to be right. false. Right. Yeah, right. Right. right? Yeah. So I don't think that sentence is right. it's something yeah. like that, maybe. Uh, then it seems to me, and we want to say an attorney has a duty, uh, while attorneys uh, do not guarantee the veracity of their, of their client's evidence, attorneys uh, may not uh, introduce or use evidence that they know to be false. Right? And if such evidence is introduced, they must take reasonable measures consistent with their duty of confidentiality to seek to correct, uh, they, to seek the, to correct the record. And I think that's the rule. More or less, something like that. Uh, Take the digest out of the content of your opinion. Yeah, I mean, though, I think that digest then speaks direct, has the virtue of then speaking more directly to the actual questions posed. So I, I will fix it. I'm going to fix the digest. And is it just an, a thought and open to? Rejection. <laughs> um, I know we have a footnote that we're not addressing the criminal issue. I think it's useful to have it in the digest to say this opinion only addresses issues that come out in a civil context. Uh, just so that no one's, you know, since we've seen the three issues of civil, 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 we're going to get to the digest and it's, you know, and so on. And someone reading this is going to say, well, this comes out in criminal context. 
And so maybe it's just useful to just say if this is to, to make the limiting statement in the digest or some, in some way. A um, couple of other minor points on, at, at line 66. Just a couple of words on the same. The attorney has no reason to know before trial that witnesses yeah. deposition testimony was pressured. Uh, sorry, I my line shifted so I don't know Okay, it's line 66, 68 now. Oh, 68. The attorney has no reason right. to know. Thank you. I would take out in the next line the word then. At trial, witness testifies on client's behalf. I would take up then, because it's kind of obvious. And then in the last sentence of that paragraph, um, the client is not instructing the attorney not to reveal the perjured testimony, because it's already, uh, but rather, and so this wasn't clear to me. Um, so what I was meant to say. I, I don't want you to reveal to the court or uh -huh. anyone who needs to know that the testimony was perjured. That's that's what that is. But so that so the, that's so that the witness has already testified. Yes. So then I think it would be better to say the client instructs the attorney not to reveal that the testimony was perjured. Right. Uh, yeah. Which yeah. then clarifies that. Because uh, otherwise it sounds like yeah. he doesn't want anyone to know that there was such a testimony in the first place. Um, another missing word at line 160, uh, 159, I don't know what number it is now, it's a paragraph that starts according to opinion 1983-75, yeah. um, the sentence, if the client refuses to allow the testimony to be corrected, the attorney is required to move the court to allow withdrawal, withdrawal ALF to withdrawal. Um, in two paragraphs down, I'll just remove all this one. Now it's line 176. I would change the subjunctive into, into direct. Uh, instead of would have, say has. Um, the sentence is, should remonstration with the client, with client fail, the attorney knowing that the false testimony is material and could have an impact on the outcome of the case, has a mandatory duty to withdraw. And that's just a right. stylistic. That's, that's all I have. My, my. Okay. Overall, I think this is almost ready to go. It would be so great to have this go out on Andrew's watch. Uh, a couple of, just a couple of things. Um, in uh, line 98, and I'm not sure these are all good, but in line 98 where it says actual knowledge of perjury, we want to say actual knowledge of falsity, right, or that the testimony is false, because that's the trigger, right, not whether the client, not whether the speaker intended to deceive, oh, but whether yeah. in fact the testimony is known to be false. So we should need a falsity? Uh, so in 98, that would just be a... a you know what I was, uh, I, I, that was willful on my part. Because uh, I thought, that's what, if you, the footnote, I was thinking about materiality. Um, I, I really don't believe every time a lawyer goes, that can't be true. Well, I just heard something that I think the witness is lying. It, it could be on something true. No, uh, that, that, totally that arise to the level of perjury. And I don't think it implicates ethical duties. No, but we don't, but, we, but this is clearly, this is clearly material. Yeah. In the situation we're talking. Because yeah. the witness admitted to fabricating the claim, so it's not going to be. I mean, they're they're knowingly lying. It's not just that it's. But uh, but my point is that it, it doesn't matter 
if if the person has testified to something that is known to be false, even if they did so inadvertently, right? I think the lawyer has an obligation to correct. I mean, right. an obligation obligation not to use that testimony. So and, and, not, and to seek to correct the record. So Matt, are you saying that 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 what Steve just said is true, but only if the information is material, only if it constitutes perjury? And we're talking about scenario two. Let me go back and look at scenario two. I, I, I mature, but per, perjury, uh, my point is that perjury has a cementer element, right? Which I don't think we need to make part of the opinion. I don't think it's, I don't, I mean, I, I'll just tell you an example from my limited litigation practice. I once sat at a council table when the witness said, um, uh, I was sunk in place X, right, and we happened to have our billing records for some strange reason open in front of us, and we knew that the client was with us, right, and they weren't, they weren't lying, I don't think, they were, to they were in the middle of a brutal cross-examination, they were totally confused, <coughs> but what they said uh, was false, right, and we felt we had an obligation to, in, this, in that case, to, uh, advise the witness that they are correct. It, and it, it, with no perjury because the witness didn't didn't intend to see the court. Mm -hmm. but That's interesting. That's a real interesting problem. Right. I've, I've never nice. had a trial. Never I've had quite a few where something didn't come out wrong. Yeah. <laughs> right. And if you have to let the judge know that in your professional judgment that witness got it wrong every time they get it wrong. That we knew. We knew. <laughs> we knew. We didn't. We weren't making a professional judgment. We were sitting there remembering the meeting with the client and looking at our billing records. No, I don't. Mind. <laughs> we knew. I'm just saying that's a. But that's the that the knowledge standard is what ought to do the work there, not the fact that it's. Uh, if you're going to take out or the materiality ought to do. The if you're going to take out some sort of mens rea on the witness's part, uh, you're then calling upon the trial lawyer to exercise a lot of judgment and discretion. No, I think the knowledge. Hold on. Uh, it's 80. the materiality. Matt's exactly right. I yeah. mean, you're right, too. I mean, I don't think it's. it's it's not the enter that we're talking about, but it definitely has. It, so it's not everything that's wrong that the witness says that's wrong. But if the witness says something that's wrong that's like case changing, that's dispositive, then you, yeah, you do have to correct it, whether or not they meant to lie. What if I said it has it has some skepticism to actual knowledge of willfully false testimony? Well, that's perjury. What? Yeah, but I don't know why this is because because I think that's misleading. Leading in so far as it suggests that it's the willfulness that makes the creates the duty to do something. Why can't you say um, actual, actual knowledge of the materially, the materially, false, materially false testimony? Right. Respect the the you want to capture materiality, right? Yeah. So fine. So material. say material. Yeah. Steve's saying by saying perjury. You're bringing in two concepts, materiality and scienter, and you don't need scienter. I haven't thought about, but that's true. I'm just thinking that now. I mean, what, what, but what you have here is the attorney is aware that a witness has admitted to lying. That's, that's what makes it pretty easy. But that's what makes it, that's what gives the attorney knowledge. Yes. It's yes. the admission of so, so the attorney has knowledge. That's, I mean, and that's, I'm very, concerned about imposing duties on attorneys every time a witness just gets a material fact wrong. And I, you, know, you see it happen all the time and it's just the way human beings are. Sure. But if you know that it's a material fact and it's wrong. I mean well, I think I think it's a material fact question. Wrong. How do you put it this way? Suppose suppose that you have a document that somebody created in your company, right? In your client's company. Or your in your in the company that is your client. The document was created. It was created totally innocently, right? But it's totally wrong, <laughs> right? Can you introduce that document as proof of the proposition that's stated? Doesn't have anything to do with whether the document was a lie or not. The person who wrote it 
completely believed it to be true at the time, and you introduce it as evidence for the proposition if you know that the proposition is false. That's really abstract. I mean, no, it's, it's not. Abstract. It's not abstract because I think it, it, it's the principle we're talking about. The principle is you don't knowingly introduce false testimony, period. Okay. And you correct material false statements, or you try to, if there maybe I think materiality is what's doing the work here. So, 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 I think this is an interesting discussion, but other than you know it's false, so that that speaks to your point. But in a practical sense, if we wrote an opinion telling lawyers every time something was false, they had to disclose it. That would create a problem. So Amy's idea of incorporating materiality. No, I'm, I, I, I'm totally on board with materiality. I think materiality is critical. Just uh, I, I, I'm not arguing against that. It's a very interesting discussion, and I think that, that Stephen's raising um, some nuances here. My, my, my sort of just concern is that how we frame the issues is about perjury with respect to issues two and three. So we've assumed that we're dealing with a, a factual scenario that rises to the level of perjury. And so if we're going to get into those nuances, it might create some substantial changes to this opinion. And I don't know if we want to go that way. So that, that, I just wanted to flag Well, that. there's, there's, I, that's, Stephen, I'm not, I wasn't quarreling with your hypothetical. I was going to tell you I didn't need to know a lot more. It, it helped me know how to answer that. So I, to, so I know something's false. I said, well, why do I know it's false? What kind of impact does that have on the case? Uh, because there's there's testimony that comes in all the time that I say that's incredibly inaccurate. That's totally implausible. I I, I don't I don't believe that it really happened like that. But that's not actually the test, though. I, I could have subjective beliefs. I, I, did, I am I'm in complete agreement with you. Okay. I'm not arguing with that but at I, all. Then we just start communicating. No, I'm not. I uh, I'm saying that I, I'm I Amy caught. I'm, Caught my point, right? Which is, I'm saying that Sienter is not part of the issue, except insofar as it confirms the attorney's knowledge. It makes this opinion easier to write and, and, and helpful if there's a right line that's displayed by these facts. I guess I would say, Steve, I don't think our, it undermines our opinion if we leave it that way, because that's the question we asked. I mean, could ask a different question, like what are the attorney's duties when the attorney knows that the witness has um, committed, has made a material, stated a material falsehood. And we framed it as what are your duties if the, um, if the witness has committed perjury. So, I mean, I'm not sure. We're not, we're not, we're not, we could argue, we don't rule out your position, Steve. We're just stating a slightly different proposition or answering a slightly different question. Well, yeah, you know, I... Uh, Stephen, tell me, tell me, uh, and then, yeah. what, what, I, I, I want to incorporate this, and I... No, it's, I, 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 I hear, I hear Amy's point. I don't feel, I mean, I, I think that I, I'm pretty committed to the principle that the, the basic principle of driving this is the obligation to correct a material falsehood or not to present materially false evidence. I think that is, in fact, what the law is. But if we've limited the decision to whether you have to disclose perjury, uh, then I'm fine to keep it to keep it uh, that way, and we don't have to get into the nuance of uh, of whether scienter uh, uh, is. With, uh, whether pulling C enter out of the opinion would change it. I think it, uh, my view would be it shouldn't, uh, and I think that's a actual more helpful opinion because it actually captures uh, the reality of what the attorney's obligations are. But if we want to frame it as just a perjury opinion, I'm okay with that. I, I, I'll take a second look at that. Um, and I don't. You know, I'm not going to, I'll, I'll do my best not to just have yeah. my own inertia. Um, yeah. And I will second guess myself on that. And I'll, so I will look at that even closer. Thank you.
the other point I was going to say is on my uh, footnote three, I think it might be useful to make clear that in footnote three, uh, we're not um, uh, actually opining, particularly about the use of the narrative approach for a third party witness. Right? I mean, I think the use of the narrative approach for a third party witness is pretty doubtful logically, because the third party witness has no right to, uh, uh, no constitutional right to testify. Right? And uh, it's, I, just, I just would want to uh, be clear that we're not, we're not endorsing that. Right. Uh, my recollection is we, talk, we, we did talk about this uh, last time on the Saturday, and I, if I can point out what I said last, what I remember saying is, I used the word accepted with with intention when I wrote that footnote. Mm -hmm. I, I read the case, I read it, I read it closely. Yeah. The court acknowledged that that is exactly what occurred, and the court let it go. The court accepted it. The court didn't say, that's what you should do. It just acknowledged that it happened, then it let it happen. It, it, it didn't. Okay. I I've forgotten that discussion. Yeah. I apologize. Okay. That, well, that, that satisfies. But me. that doesn't mean that you and I have to continue to use the word accepted. I just no. I think it's, I, I think I understand what you're okay. saying. typos on, on that same line 98 that there's a T missing at the end of to use the testimony at trial. See that on 98? Yeah, I got a good proof for it. And then I think it's the penal code, not the pedal code. You <laughs> <laughs> could be wrong, you want to go back and look. Put that out and see if anyone knows the reasonable code. The vacation spell check didn't catch that. <laughs> Wait, uh, where's the pedal code? Um, it's Put it on two. Put it on two. Thank you for that laugh. You also have on that same footnote, on A is repeated twice. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, Richard, what? Right. Well, she's got that. Okay. Um, and then the, the only, the, on footnote six, I, I think what you're meaning, I, I found sort of unsatisfying. The additional facts may make the attorney's duty to withdraw mandatory. And I think what, I think it would be clearer to say additional facts not present here may make the attorney's duty mandatory. Because it made me think, well, what additional facts are you saying? Are they here? What's happening? Right. You're right. Um, but that was it. I, I think this looks great. Really good job. I wouldn't normally do this, Matt. I have one other. It's just a typo, but you're so close. Oh, well, I, 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 I'm on that same uh, page. I'm one of those impaired baby boomers that <laughs> starting to lose the for free. I'm going to audit your thoughts. How far back do we go? That's an admission. How far back should we go? Um, on what was line 127 of page 4, so it's. It's in the just. Show yeah, more of the red line. It's right about that, where you just redlined uh, attorney's ethical duty to refuse to be party wait, wait, to wait. any such opportunity. Party to. Yeah. Anyway, I, I agree. I mean, great job, Matt. This is like super close. I mean, obviously, this is one in the middle bucket, so to speak. He's up for a So, Matt, in terms of converting this to the new rules, yeah, uh, I would closely take a look at uh, 3.3A3. 3.3A3. Comments 4 and 5. Um, they may appear in, in various places. I specifically noted that at a line 164. But I think you'll find that helpful. It shouldn't. Uh, I read in context of that paragraph, looking back at your opinion, you may wish to also reference 3.3 in scenarios 1 and 2. But with respect to that paragraph, I don't think it's going to change your analysis, but it will help bolster and provide more authority.
for what you're saying in terms of steps to remonstrate and and what the lawyer's got to do in under scenario three. But 3.3a will take place most of where you reference 5 to. Okay. Yeah. This is the, um, we're doing 17003 uh, regarding the duty of confidentiality to a prospective client. It was a memo that Marshall and Steve did that was submitted with the materials that sort of outlines um, the gist of the issues they're thinking about. And I don't know, maybe you just want to take a couple minutes and sort of summarize that for folks. Steve put together this memo with some minor revisions by me, and he found some interesting LA County decisions and uh, the A versus B case, which he said is well known. It wasn't until I read your memo that it was well known to me, but I read that case and it was very fascinating. The questions Steve presents in the memo are a couple of different scenarios, and it really kind of highlights the potential tension between the duty of communication, the duty of loyalty, and the duty to maintain the confidence of the client. There's a lot of tension in the potential scenarios that he's outlined here. Uh, and I think, because he'll be involved in it, getting to the underlying principles and trying to weigh these duties is going to be a challenge interesting and I think it would require a lot of thought. While I was here I was doing a little bit of research on that. You know, and I think it's going to turn someone in whether you're state or federal court based on some just limited research I've done. Uh, none of this takes into account the duty of candor in court and I think that would be beyond what we're doing. But broadly speaking, listen, if you looked at flat where a prospective client came and started talking about a case against an existing client on an unrelated matter. Uh, you can then start developing permutations, which Steve did, which is, what if it was on a related matter? What if the client told you something pertinent to another client on a related matter? What if you're representing two clients on the same matter, and you learn uh, something that brings back to you. Uh, so you 
breakdown is same same case, same two different clients, you learn something from one that could impact the rights of the other or will be important to you. But it wasn't told to you other than your confidence in the general principles of keeping your confidence and then you have to make some choices about conflict. Is, is that a, in a joint client representation scenario? Is that what you got? That would be one two clients in the same matter that are joint clients? The more inter yes. The, but the more interesting one to me is what happens like in flat when the court concluded the lawyer had no duty, no duty to tell the prospective client of the statute of limitations problems. They don't address should the lawyer then turn to the existing client and say, oh, by the way, you're about to get sued. And Steve's permutations, I think, get interesting because what if it's on something that would be highly germane to the existing client on matters that you're already representing them on? And so we haven't played out the permutations, but flat left, quite frankly, a lot of open questions on the tension between your duty to maintain a confidence with the person you talk to versus the impact it has on your other client. Steve, I'm going to let you. Well, I think that that, that captures it. We're interested in this conflict of duties problem. And um, and um, and we're interested in, in uh, we're not sure, I don't think we're sure what the exact shape of the opinion should be yet. Right? We aren't, we're not sort of saying these are the questions that we would certainly talk about because it may be that we conclude that some aspects are sufficiently well settled that you're really only talking about them essentially to lay background. Uh, for the, but it's pretty clear to me that the sort of central questions about what happens when uh, that the, the sort of got the one that got us both interested, which is the question of what happens if you have a an initial interview with somebody and you learn something that is really important to a present client in a present matter. Right, uh, that's a that's a really interesting one. That, that, that I, what sparked my interest was that I, I had a pro bono client where that came up. Right? Where a public interest organization that had a very strong policy of promising confidentiality to its prospective people because it wanted to get them in the door and they knew that they were people who would distrust the legal system, right? Learned something that was critical evidence in a case that they were prosecuting. Uh, for uh, for somebody else. What, one I, thing that would help me when we start doing our research is I haven't found a lot of cases yet that really talk about balancing and prioritizing or weighing your duties to a client. You can get all kinds of cases that talk about a lawyer's paramount duty to the client, but the lawyer has several duties to the client. And so a question that Flat raises is, does the duty of confidentiality to the prospective client trump the duty to communicate and the duty of loyalty, which go hand in hand, to the other client? I, have, I don't know the answer yet. I think I do, but I, I don't feel comfortable And, and the rudder guide says there's no answer in California, so with that, we thought that was awesome. Well, I, I agree that there might, might be useful. And, and it may be that the answer is categorical, not a balancing issue, and that you end up having to manage it by, man, manage it exclusively through certain kinds of advanced waivers and so forth and so on. Uh, we don't know the answer, but we think it's a, we think it's a really interesting topic. I agree it's interesting, and I think even outside, I mean, the perspective client thing is particularly interesting as a context, but the same, I've seen the same principle come up in practice even outside of that, where the, a firm represents two clients, you've cleared conflicts, there's no reason foreseeably to think that there's going to be any disparity or conflict, yet somewhere along the way, for whatever reason, client A has some piece of information that actually you know 
would be entirely material and desired to be known by client B with respect to their matter, even though they may not be adverse with respect to either one of those matters in, in the sense you would think. And so, yeah, I mean, even outside, I, I've seen that. I think you're right. I mean, what do you do with that is a, a very interesting question. I guess the other point I would make when I asked about the joint client thing, I just thought because, uh, and I forget what the code section is, but would the, you know, the stat, the evidence code provision play some role? I mean, if you have true joint clients, you know, there is some provision under the evidence code about there is. the extent to which, you know, they can quote unquote sort of have their own cabins confidential information as opposed to their their joint client in a true joint client representation. I think there's a new case that says you have to share that there was an older case that says if one client A tells you something they ask to keep in confidence, you can't mm -hmm. it is privilege against but client B unless there's a lawsuit. I, I and I did, I, my brain's a little scrambled right now, so I can't really remember the present state, but there's two interesting attorney-client privilege cases that might address some of that. I think you, and I think it's still an interesting question because as a practical matter, when I talk to lawyers, I hear lawyers say, it doesn't matter, and if someone tells you keep this secret now, and you heard it, you absolutely have to, and I hear other people say, if you lay down, no way, look at the evidence code. So, I mean, there's practitioners, have a diversity of viewpoint. Right. So the San Francisco right. Bar did an opinion on Mass Torts opinion oh, that talks about joint clients and has all that case law. Oh, great. Okay, good. Because that evidence code, you know, only applies in in a lawsuit between the two clients. So it really doesn't get you very far in, in the analysis. Um, well, so the, but it does go to expectation, right? If you know that it may not be case I'm thinking the of arose. In a, mal in a malpractice case filed by client A but not client B. Right, that's Anton. Yeah, yeah. I, I just don't remember. I'm almost sure it's Anton. And the, the court says uh, client B, the non suing client, had no right to stop the appropriate communications from being revealed. Right. right. So it was kind of an interesting, really interesting. But it, I think it goes against an earlier case and it may be fact specific. I remember reading it and like, boy, that changes the game a little bit. It does change the game. Anyway, I think it's I think it's a great like idea. Great idea. Great, great idea. There's a, a safe bar opinion. The facts might be a little bit different, but 2003-163. It's a lawyer who represents two clients at the same time. And the lawyer, the, one client tells the lawyer something in confidence that is relevant. To the other Thank client you. at the same time. What was it? You got to says you got to withdraw, and you can't review it. Uh, Two thousand three dash one sixty three. We got a lot of opinions on two thousand three. It's a good year. <laughs> All right. What was that? Two thousand three dash one sixty three. So what are the duties of a lawyer represents a corporation that the outside counsel and who simultaneously represents an officer of that corporation individually, and the lawyer receives information that creates a conflict between the lawyer's duties and confidentiality and duty to communicate significant developments. That seems like you would have to address whether they would be okay with it. like if they said you absolutely can't disclose the information then I guess that's the path you're going down but if it's a situation where you say I, I have to share this information and have them agree to it so it's obviously present some kind of a conflict right. of interest that they'd have to either waive or you'd have to withdraw right is that the I, I guess they didn't see I mean we always put in our joint client you know we can't keep secrets right, right. we're agreeing right. that we right. can't keep secrets right. Right. so they're obviously assuming right. that that wasn't done. And right. Clients didn't That's agree true. to it. Right. So then you just have to debate. You know, which which fiduciary duty am I going to breach? You know, the one to this client or the one to that client? I I think the the hypothetical they posited is That's really interesting. I mean, it all sounds interesting. The business of learning something from a prospective client that places you in a compromised position as to an existing client, I mean, imagine you 
you've been sitting here, you've been working on this case, you've been representing this client, you clear conflicts on a prospective matter which you may not even take, and they come in and they tell you something that you suddenly realize is very material to your existing client, long-time existing client maybe, and their memo is sort of pausing, you know, where are you at? Is that where I have to possibly withdraw from representing the existing client? I mean, it just, I think that, to me, um, I mean, I think there's confusion about the joint client stuff too, and I know there's some inconsistency in the opinions and stuff, but I, I think the pers perspective of client stuff and the unanswered questions by Platt, those are super interesting. Yeah. Um, well, it's yeah. intellectually interesting. The joint client problem probably surfaces more often. That's true. I mean, but but it does have a, I won't say a simple answer, but a relatively straightforward way to try and head off some of that is to do what Suzanne said. But despite that, to, to your comment, you, I mean, you'd be surprised how many people don't put in that stuff you just <laughs> right, said. Right. And they take on the joint representation, and then they're in this quagmire where they didn't contractually make clear, you know, that there wouldn't be any shared, shared confidences. So, so yeah. I mean, it can get challenging if you try to do joint clients, concurrent clients, and the prospective client. I mean, that, that could get really yeah. cumbersome. You might yeah, have to take a Decide what portion of that. You may take smaller bites and versions. Right, right. Because I think the prospective client situation in particular is really interesting. And I actually do get a lot of questions about that. And it's it's hard, you know, even doing what, what we do, you know, someone's calling us consulting about suing a lawyer. We do also represent lawyers, you know, and so if someone's calling about suing one of our lawyers, of course we're conflicted out, but then can I? Should I? First of all, can I? And number two, must I tell my existing client? I got a call yesterday to be retained by somebody in a potential family farming breakup who was the adversary for my best client 25 years ago. They're all related. So he says, you can't tell anybody, I'm not telling anybody, but at some point, the question is going to have to be, because I don't know enough about their respective businesses, could this impact this long-standing client of mine? Would it be a negative for them? And I won't have any way of knowing unless I talk to somebody, and I can't. So <clears throat> right there, yesterday, ran into something. So it's interesting. Yeah, no, it's a good. I think everybody agrees. It's gonna be a good, good topic. All right. Well, I think I think uh, it's unusual, but we can't adjourn early. Well, it's a practical matter in terms of what's left. How huge this agenda is, we'll never get through it. <laughs> is that okay? With you? Yeah. Yeah, I, so we will. I mean, the, the, the few opinions that are left are all lead drafters that have had to leave. So thanks, everybody, and we'll get out a little early. Is anybody going to LAX? I am. I'm not sure. Huh? Has anyone appeared and listened in from the public yet? And that's one person. Oh, you mean uh, the live stream? <laughs> I don't know. Can you guys keep trying? Yes. I'm almost sure I got it. Good. Because, because it's, it's interesting because my mother, my father, my father passed away. That's my stream. Because there's someone important. But don't worry, the, the camera was there. Oh, well, good luck to you and your future endeavors in your garden. <laughs> Be careful with some more flies. Flies. Uh, Buzz uh, Fresno, uh, I really wonder. You know, one of my, um, uh, my, one of my, uh, one of my colleagues, yeah, I do. Have a case? Can I 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 have a case
And so that, that will give you some insight. Oh, yeah. what was such a wonder panel on? Sorry, he's a nice guy. Yeah, I think he. Yeah, you have to Because you know what summer traffic does? I don't think I'm going to do that. No problem. You do a lot of I mean, I do. 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 Just give me a month's notice. Yes. I'm going to run to the restroom. Yeah, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. We're going to do it.